Yes, we're ready to go. Oh, sorry. No, it's all right. All right. Graham, yeah. you're up. So we're looking at the, the new fiscal note, which is behind Graham. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Graham Campbell from the Legislative Joint Fiscal Office. I'm here to present a fiscal note or an estimate on what I believe has been discussed here in this committee and what I was asked by um, the chair to, to estimate. Um, essentially what I have done is uh, done an, an estimate on an amendment that would first allow the current medical dispensaries in Vermont to begin retail sale of cannabis and July of 2020, and they would gain this right by paying a $75,000 fee for the first year, and then every subsequent year after that, they would go into the sort of commercial licensing um, and fee structure that would be established by whatever board comes out of the bill. And so um, our revenue estimates are broken down into two parts. Uh, the first is the fees, and um, we believe that they're, as you are aware there are five current medical dispensaries in Vermont and we believe that all of them would take advantage of this opportunity um, so that would raise three hundred seventy five thousand dollars for fiscal year 20 um, from those fees and ultimately how those fees get used is um, like I think to the committee um, or could go to, to funding the board etc um, Stephanie Barrett can, can help you with the cost of estimates for the board etc um, in subsequent years, as I mentioned, they would pay, they would go into the, the, the normal commercial licensing scheme um, that's been discussed in S54, and you've heard this already, but that, I think the bill says the, that fee structure would have to be uh, set an equivalent of Massachusetts, it sort of raises the Massachusetts equivalent of fees, mm -hmm. which is about $650,000. Um, and then there's the change to the uh, excise tax revenues. So this bill has a 16% excise tax, and we estimate that in fiscal year 21, this will raise between 500 and a million dollars, 500,000 and a million dollars. Um, and I'll just put down these two tables here just so you can see the comparison. So table one is our estimates for what this, this amendment would raise. Um, and you can see we're calling year zero here, um, it's fiscal year 21, because in the original S54, um, there was no revenue flowing in in fiscal year 21 when retail sales were expected to begin in, in July of 21. And so this pushes the, rev the re de revenue generating sales um, up a year, so you would get between 500,000 and a million. And because those stores, you have five retail stores that are sort of up and running and more mature and are, are, have a better idea of the landscape and have less capacity issues, um, those five stores have that, that leg up and so you would, your subsequent years are a little bit higher than before because you have five stores that are a little bit more advanced in the process. So when we did these estimates, we, um, sort of accounted for factors in the first year of sales to adjust for both regulatory issues that occurred in other states or um, retail stores understanding the regulatory environment and having potential issues getting the, the licenses to, to grow, to cultivate and to sell, but also the capacity constraints um, that uh, are inherent to the market. You can't, you can't, bring marijuana cannabis across the other state lines, so you have to generate the capacity yourself within state. And so um, one of the issues that a lot of states have is generating that capacity by either setting up farms or indoor facilities. And so there are two factors. In my conversations with Shane Lynn, um, he thought that there the regulatory side of this is the regulatory side of that adjustment is smaller, and I agree um, because they already have the the understanding of the regulatory environment for medical, um, and also it's a relatively straightforward um, regulatory system where they just pay a seventy-five thousand dollars fee. Um, 
it's the capacity issues that we feel that are sort of holding back this estimate. And we don't believe that um, they are, uh, the capacity issues that exist under this system are relatively similar to those that would occur under any normal retail system, regardless of whether you gave the medical marijuana. Because um, we believe that if these medical dispensaries, let's say they get the right to do retail sales at the end of 2019 or so, mm -hmm. then they would have, there, there's no, they have to somehow get their supply up. And so the one way they could do that is to purchase land and grow it outdoors, but then you have to plant it, you have to put the seeds in, you have to grow, you have to harvest it and produce it. Or you have to build an indoor facility, which requires raising the capital for it, building it, then planting. So we think there are going to be capacity issues here that are holding back this estimate. And that's why it might not be as high as some people might think. But I'm still here generating um, a fair amount of revenue in the first year by doing this. Questions? Okay, Nelson, and then I'm um, yeah. You're talking about a capacity that the medical facilities have now for their self. Do you think any of them are not currently, I don't know, is there a limit on how much they can grow up today these medical facilities? I'm not sure if I know the answer to that, but um, our projection is that whatever they can grow right now would not be sufficient to meet normal retail sales or, or the demand that would come as a result of legalization. So, and that's even, that's just, uh, and that's something that Shane Lennon said, that's something that's happened in every other state. We wouldn't be unique in that manner. It, this sort of going from zero to, uh, like if you're a store, going from zero sales whatsoever to meeting that demand would be tougher than the medical um, dispensaries meeting that demand. And that's why we think this the capacity constraint here is a little bit less than um, what it would be from going from zero to full retail sales, but um, it's still, we're just thinking about the, the, the process that they would have to go to to meet that demand. Um, and we just see it as, you know, even though they have the extra year, a good chunk of that year, we believe, would be having trouble meeting the, the demand for, for cannabis. Now, I have a clarifying question. Mm -hmm. um, do you know if all five dispensaries are willing to do retail? So I haven't asked all of them. My discussions with Shane were that, and I asked him, well, do you think this would be something that all the dispensaries would take advantage of? And he said yes. So okay. we are assuming that they would. Go ahead. And, and have you looked at the possibilities for the cultivators in the illicit market wanting to maybe step forward and be part of the start. Has that been explored? We have not explored that. That's an idea that I've heard, although I, I, I'm, not, I'm not aware of how, if there's any sort of regulatory framework that would be involved with that, whether, some, whether there could be sort of, I don't know, informal sales from individual cultivators to the dispensary. Um, but right now in this estimate, we're assuming that all their supply is going to have to come from themselves um, rather than from outside sources. Jiki? Um, well, that concerned me with what that question in the response was. Um, I think under the, the tax and regulate system, should it pass? Do we, are we actually going to consider taking homegrown from a, you see what I'm saying? From somebody that doesn't have the, uh, or perhaps doesn't have the capabilities of growing it to the extent that we're trying to do here is make it, make it a very safe product. To me, that unless I'm missing something here, uh, that person might not have the uh, capability or so I think oh, that good pot, a bad pot, a good pot, being, uh, <laughs> a, a, a safer pot. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Call it pot black here. It's, it should be a safer pot, and I'm just wondering. If, yeah. If the demand is high enough, is somebody else going to be able to, to sell to? 
yeah. to one of these dispensaries and have them take it in and then they you know, do their thing. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming like make it into edibles and stuff because you know, I don't know a lot of these homegrown people are going to be able to make the edibles or they're, they're not. Right. They're going to make the flowers. Yeah. Uh, Michelle, I think it would be best for you to address that question. Uh, sure, I think it's a, it's a bigger discussion and maybe when we start to go, go through and, and bring Mark up and, and maybe talk about it in a, in a broader context. I know there's been a lot of discussion about is there a way to bring some small growers into uh, in, that would be selling to the dispensaries as part of the early sales model. And I think if you, you've identified one of the, the main issues, the biggest issue I, I think for me, which is that um, under what regulatory structure would they be operating? And there essentially isn't one for them now, and to adopt rules would take all the time that we're talking about, and so that doesn't really work for the early sales. Um, and so, uh, you know, but there are a lot of issues around, you know, like traceability. So right now you have, you know, with, with virtual information with dispensaries, you know, you have that tracking. There's no, you know, you would have to set up tracking so that you would know how much is being grown with a grower, and then how much is then going to a dispensary, which dispensary, making sure that half of it's not going out the back door, things like that. So there are a lot of regulatory compliance issues, and I know that there's also been, and I, I don't know because I haven't been part of the discussions really, but floated the idea of whether or not you could take folks who are currently registered under the hemp program and somehow maybe finesse it a little bit and work it under that. Um, and again, I haven't. Uh, had the time yet to have a more in-depth conversation, but I touched base with Michael O'Grady, who is the attorney who's been working on that, and his uh, initial sense was that if you if you did that and you allow people who were registered under the hemp program to be growing cannabis for the sales to the dispensary, that you would essentially kill the state's chances of being able to have, have be approved under the farm bill language. Hmm. So I can have somebody come in, I can have them come in and address that later, but again, we just kind of, had a five minute conversation down there because I had heard that idea being floated around and, and he works on the health stuff. So. Oh, question, sorry. Um, what numbers of customers were you working with to come up with these numbers? Um, so we didn't use the number of customers. The way this is structured is from uh, data from Oregon and Colorado about the, um, the size of their marijuana retail, or their cannabis retail establishments and what they um, have averaged in terms of sales mm -hmm. in, in a fully mature market. Right. And so this kind of assumes that uh, the medical dispensaries, um, once they are operating, will be operating um, along the same lines as a normal retail store in Colorado or Oregon. We talked about an office where we thought that it would be greater than a Colorado or Oregon store or less than. We ultimately decided that they would be similar. Um, you know, some of the larger dispensaries in the world might be higher, um, but some of them might be lower. So we didn't have any data to sort of to indicate that they would be any greater than a Colorado okay. or Oregon retail so store. So you're basing your numbers on, on sales. On sales from other in other states. Yeah. Okay. So, Bob, go ahead. That, this is Mike Huntley for you. Uh, <coughs> we currently don't place any limitation on the medical side growing capacity. Right. Yes, we do. Yeah. How's it going? That's my question. Mm -hmm. So much per customer? Yeah. Capacity. Capacity for the amount that's grown by the dispensary, yes. They are tagged for, so the current law is that, dis is that uh, a patient has to designate one particular dispensary that can't go to all of them. And so the DPS keeps track of how many patients have designated each dispensary. And then there's a formula that's in statute for how much they can then grow. And it's the per patient limit for what they're allowed to grow personally is two mature and seven immature plants. And so that's the formula they use. So, they, so if, a, if one dispensary has, you know, 1,500 patients, you would do, you know, two times 15 for the number of mature plants that they could have any one time, and seven times the 1,500 for the immature plants. And that's what they're allowed to have as inventory any one time. So it's tagged to that. 
there's a, a bill S117 that's up in human services right now, and that eliminates that particular um, uh, cap, and it doesn't, and it requires that it, it gets away with the with the requirement that patients have to designate one dispensary. Um, but one of the things that I have a list, and I've been talking with the dispensaries about, like what are the things that if you did do early sales, that I would want to specifically say that for purposes of being able to meet the retail market for that one year period, what would they be exempted from? And certainly plant counts are one of those, and that's in the language that was in 196, but in listening to the discussions also and thinking about there are currently in statute only allowed to have one grow facility in addition to the places, the two locations where they can serve patients. And so you'd want to say they could have a second grow, grow facility because you can imagine, right now imagining that, that, that they probably only have a physical space that allows them to really meet their patient needs, right? But then if they're gonna need to grow a lot more, that actual warehouse or whatever it is they use, they need, may need a second facility and things like that. So I'm keeping a running tally of the things that we wanna kind of address to say, for purposes of that one year retail sale, they're exempted from these laws in statute and rules for that, for that temporary period. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? No. I have a question. Yes. Um, so, so Graham, in, in putting together this, you're using a model, right, based on Colorado and Oregon data? And Washington. In Washington, and too. And Massachusetts. And Matt. Oh, oh, okay. So, okay. So, we, so if this is changes, how hard is it to plug in? So, if the, so the, I should say, the, what the, me, what the medical dispensaries will sell is based upon Colorado and Oregon. The whole model for how much revenue for retail sales will is based upon those four states. Those so the question states. about how, if you if this has changed, how difficult would it be? It depends on the change. If it's a change to like the the tax rate, or right. um, that's relatively easy and quick to change. Um, if it's a change to timing, or um, yeah, things like timing them with things that we sort of have to give thought to and um, and then make judgment calls from there. So it kind of depends on what the change would be. Okay, I was just, just wondering, I mean, um, and you know, yesterday we had legislative council um, come in and talk about the, the tax sections uh, of the bill. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wanted to follow up on that because she referenced you a couple of times with respect to some of the, the policy decisions um, that were made with respect to the tax rate. Um, so, uh, you know, what, what, how did the Senate arrive at 16%? Uh, what it left the Senate Judiciary was a 10% 10% excise tax. Oh. And then when it went to Senate Finance, it, they were arguing, not arguing, they were discussing <laughs> whether they wanted to place the sales tax on top of that as well. And then furthermore, whether there'd be a local option available to um, municipalities, and whether if you did that local option, would be subject to the 30-70 or the 30, 70 split with the pilot fund. And uh, basically it just came down to, we're not gonna do the sales tax, but we're going to just make it 16%. It puts us under Massachusetts, um, and that's basically how it was arrived at, um, sort of a committee discussion about what, and it sort of came out of whether we should whether we should have the sales tax on it. Because if you did do the sales tax, then all that revenue would go to the education fund. And they ultimately decided not to do that, but at the same time to raise the rate at the equivalent of the additional 6%. And that's what they supplement. So Senate Finance's goal was to be under Massachusetts tax rate? I don't know if it was their goal, but they were, um, and I, you might want to have uh, one of the members come up and put uh, it was one of the considerations that they had in their discussion. Is when they arrived at 16%, the one the reason they were happy with it was that it was under Massachusetts's tax rate. Did, did they? Did either Senate Finance or Senate Judiciary discuss the the tax, the t how the tax would influence or impact the black market? They did, yeah, and I I testified briefly on that. Um, and what I told them was that the experience in other states is that 
the tax rate is relatively important for the black market, but you have much higher tax rates in other states than what's being proposed here, and they believe that their black market has been not completely squeezed out, but um, but brought down to a very much less than it was, um, and so. Um, my experience speaking with other states that have done this is that the tax rate is not necessarily the, the thing that drives the um, whether the black market is fully existing. It plays a factor, but I, I think ultimately it comes down to lots of different things like you know how easy is it for you to get? What's the sort of um, what's the overall price? Because even in even across the country, even if it were legal everywhere, there would be differences in price, I and mean, even in the black market. The, before any legalization, the cost of cannabis out on the West Coast was significantly lower than what it was in New England. So um, those types of factors um, will play a role. And in every state where cannabis was legalized, regardless of where the tax rate, what the tax rate was, you know, up to 35% in some states, as low as um, in Massachusetts, it's, what, I can't quite remember, 20 in, in Massachusetts, they've seen precipitous drops in prices of cannabis. So that would seem to indicate that there's, um, you're, you're, you're squeezing your black market quite a bit. In our model, we assume that about 20% of the market will still be in the black market. That is higher than what um, Oregon estimated their black market. I think they had their black market about 15 or 16%. So we're being conservative. Um, did, did the Senate discuss at all a tax based on weight of product? Not in Senate finance that I can recall. No, I think that the, there have been earlier discussions around that and there were some complexities with that and it really hadn't really built up enough steam and yeah. so I think they were just mostly looking at the three kind of pots about whether or not you have the excise tax, you know, the whether there should, there should be a sales tax and then the, and then the local option. Yeah, no, I agree. Any weight tax is much more, from the administration standpoint, is much more complex. Thanks. Yeah. All your questions answered for now? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Nelson. Was it found that in all states that legalized and did the sales that basically there wasn't enough supply for the initial startup that they were running out? Or were there some states that did better than others? Uh, I probably don't know the answer to the, the second question with some states but did better. Actually, some states definitely did better than others. And Washington is like the, um, in my experience, it's sort of poster child of like both capacity and regulatory issues. Their first year of cannabis sales were really slow. Um, and so but once they sort of reformed, in the second year, they sort of reformed their regulatory structure and then they've gotten up to speed since then. Colorado's was relatively, I wouldn't say seamless, but um, they had capacity issues at the start probably read in the news. Massachusetts, I think, is having capacity issues. Um, so I don't think I could give this the super educator response of which states did it the best way and avoided the capacity and regulatory issues. Um, but I'm not sure if any other state has considered doing what's being proposed here as a medical first. And Almost all states have had their medical go first in some way. Yeah. Um, could be that they just um, uh, they rolled them out in different ways, or might they might have issued them a new permit. Like what they're like in Massachusetts, they're the first ones that get the new permits, and then but other states kind of did more of a bridge. But we've got some things, we got some information in that if you guys wanted to hear from. Probably I would probably get somebody who could talk to talk to you about that. Another question, Nelson? Yeah, my my follow up question would be is. Did any of them, the dispensaries that are medical now, did they do anything previous to the actual opening? Would they allow the expansion of grow, grow areas and things of that nature? And then was there a licensing issue with that, or was it just that they bought a license and they were automatically able to build a, a better growth of facility for themselves, larger? I, I don't know the logistics of how they did that. I have just some like basic data about which states did and, and didn't let their have their have their medical facilities go go first. But we could you know certainly pick a couple states and check with them and, and check and see 
you know, technically how did they do it and how did it work and what were their experiences for that. But uh, that was, we didn't spend any time on it that in the Senate because it wasn't part of the Senate proposal, so. Well, I just, follow up comment, I guess. I just see that if you allow the grow facilities to expand, the shortness of supply wouldn't be there and it'd be a higher return on the, the product going through these dispensaries. I think that's a, a valid statement. I would say that even if you make, if you allow them to expand and like build facilities, it takes time for them to do that. And so their advantage that the first year is not as much as you would think on the face of it. They need to sort of first get the license, they need to well, A, possibly raise the capital for the $75,000 fee. Then they have to raise the capital to either purchase land for an outdoor growing facility or an indoor growing facility, then construct it, and then plant it, then harvest it. And you know, they have under this proposal, they have essentially from July of this year through July of 2021 to get that up and going. So we estimate that, you know, by the end of 2020, then maybe they could sort of be close to up and operating. Even if they did that, they would probably run into supply issues as well because um, there's obviously a large demand for cannabis in this state and there's only five dispensaries and um, even the largest of the dispensaries couldn't build such a massive facility to meet that that capacity. So, so folks, in your email inbox is um, a memo from John Holler at Downs Rathman Martin, and John's looking at it, John Gannon is looking at it right now, uh, and has answered to some of these questions, so. Yeah, so, go ahead. so it, it indicates which states gave a head start to their medical marijuana dispensaries, and it, it's everyone that's legalized marijuana, except for Alaska, which didn't have medical marijuana dispensaries to give a head start to. And it actually explains how, how long of a head start they had um, in each state, um, so, and it references the either the legislation or the rule um, which permitted that to happen. So um, that came in on April 12th, if you're searching your email for the document. And I'm sure Kelly can post it to our page too. How? So do you know um, how states compare in terms of their startup timeline? You know, from, from you know, the, you know I, I'm assuming that the states have had the most problems with supply possibly had a compressed startup timeline. I don't know the answer to that question, how long the other states took for their timeline. Because I imagine Oregon maybe had enough time to put everything in place and then not have all the hiccups when they opened up for mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't fully know what their timelines were, although I, I don't know if there's any state that hasn't had, or even Canada that hasn't had startup issues, not startup issues, capacity mm -hmm. problems, um, even with a large lead up time. I know in Canada the lead up time was not lead up. They were talking about this being legalized almost at least a year before the first retail sales went into place, and they had capacity issues there as well. So, but I don't know that, what the form. I don't have any research that I've done that I've just looked at when they either passed a ballot initiative and what and how long it was and how what their timeline was for that. So that's something we can look into. I, I mean, if you go out there and look at data, I mean, I think once states started legalization, um, there were capacity issues, but then as, as the market matured, there became oversupply issues um, in some states. Uh, I mean, I think what you're seeing is, is a, a new business or a new business model getting off the ground and, and trying to figure out and, you know, what's the appropriate amount of, of product and how much demand is there for that product. And so I think you're gonna see these supply demand shifts as the, as the market matures in each state. Um, and I think, you know, even though some of these states have been at it for a long time, it's still a very immature market in many ways. That's a good point. Michelle? 
I just wanted to mention, I don't know whether or not Graham might be able to speak to this or not, but something that I was thinking about is that you would probably want to hear from the tax department on um, anything that they might need in order to be able to collect taxes on those early sales because the way that it's structured now is contemplating that they're not going to be collecting taxes essentially until um, until like two years out and so and the idea of like that you're going to be coming back and considering you know appropriations and does somebody need new software does somebody need a new FTE things like that but you know, even though you're only going to have five retail shops that, that would be selling and it's going to be as much smaller, you know, um, what, you know, I think I would just yeah. raise that as an issue because that isn't contemplated in the bill as, as yeah. drafted now, but you want to be thinking about that and I don't know whether or not you have some thoughts on that. Yeah, I think that's a very important issue to raise and thank you. Um, so, I. The, I don't believe the tax department collects the revenues that are produced by the medical dispensaries right now. And I, I don't think that's the case. Um, well, the, the, it's not taxed. It's not taxed. It's not like, taxed. Like, like the, right. the so fees no, right, or anything exactly. like that are not so collected by the tax department. Dispensaries pay their taxes, but there's no tax on cannabis or cannabis products. Right. So if this was a, ta a retail tax that would be collected by the tax department, they can speak to this. But generally, the rule of thumb is it's, I think they told me, like $250,000 to implement a new tax collection system. And also, um, there's, there were concerns in the Senate about um, the payments, how these payments were made, would they, would they be made in cash, would they be made electronically, how would they handle the payments? Because if they have to be handled, if the ca tax farm has to handle cash payments, then it increases the cost of the tax department. So yeah, yes, you would, and it would be, um, the community should have the tax department come in and talk about the, the cost. And in the, Mar in the Governor's Marijuana Commission, um, I believe they put $500,000 or so in their budget to collect taxes. Uh, but I don't know whether that had any, any breakdown for cash handling or new systems or anything, but it, it was in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. so. Nelson? I'm not sure if this is a question from him or something at the committee will address later. One of the things is where I keep coming back to is the, the fact that there's not going to be enough product. Is there anything in the bill, I, I haven't seen anything other than the dispensaries, that will let small growers start early because they're not really selling the product to anybody but the dispensary. But, so if they're not selling to the public, the dispensary is. So if there was something in the bill that let them start early also, would that be a problem or not? From your figures, if all of a sudden. So, if they, if something was introduced that allowed, say, an outside supplier to supply the medical dispensaries, then I would probably revise this revenue estimate upward because your your capacity constraints would be less, um, and the dispensaries would not have to spend so much time raising money and building their own facilities. Um, yeah, because small growers don't take as much time to get up and running. I don't think it's the larger growers. It's true, but again, you run into the potential issues that um, Michelle said about um, small growers here being you know, private home growers right now in Vermont, and under what regulatory structure would you put them under? Um, so. so, in discussions with the Senate on this excise tax, what um, what sort of structure was contemplated at the tax department? Because if we're looking at early sales where they're collecting from five entities, that seems to be a completely different animal than what they'll be doing in 18 months or two years when the when the broader market goes online. Right. I, I think it, the tax department's best place to answer those questions. My guess is that you're, you're kind of just pushing the time, the, the, the expense for the tax department a couple of years forward. So in S 
54 is past the house, that sort of expense doesn't come until um, fiscal year 21. Um, that, that's when they would need the sort of up and up. Sorry, yeah, fiscal year, no. Fiscal year 22. That's when the retail, retail sales are in July of 21. So that doesn't come until fiscal 22. And so it was kind of, I think they were maybe doing like a sort of two-step approach where they first established the licensing structure, the fees, and then determine about what the, the tax department, potentially other departments, would need um, to operate the, the system. Do you know um, if the tax that they're collecting on CBD sales from hemp right now is an excise tax or is it a sales tax? Sales tax, I believe. I believe there's a separate CBD excise tax. Um, I think it's just they collect the sales tax on CBD. And that is, they have the existing structure for the sales tax that having CBD in there is no extra cost to them mm -hmm. if it's the sales tax. This would be a, a new tax with a new rate. Um, mm -hmm. So that's why I think they might say that it would, there would be some startup costs for them. Mm -hmm. We will be sure to have the tax department in to answer us answer some questions. Committee, any other questions for Graham on est revenue estimates? Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Michelle, do you recall who the Senate heard from from the tax department about this? wonder what a model would look like if you do it in reverse instead of picking a tax and really come up with what are the really critical costs for bringing this um, new industry um, to a, a sustainable <clears throat> you know retail level I know there's a lot of what ifs but it just seemed backward to pick a number and then say everything's got to fall under that because that's not how you normally construct a business you kind of do it in reverse and then you come up with what it has to cost and what you can tax and so forth so it just seems trickier trying to make it work when you're working under a, a firm number mm -hmm. other thoughts committee So we have some, oh, Nelson, yeah? Mm. Okay, <laughs> go ahead and take a break. You, uh, you need to let go of your morning coffee. I'm the coordinator of Prevention Works Vermont, which is a network of the community coalitions in the state who work on prevention, substance use prevention issues. I'm also a member of the Opioid Coordination Council and a board member of the Vermont Public Health Association. But my interest in prevention isn't just professional. I am the mom of a teenage son, so I'm of course concerned how this legislation might affect his entree into adulthood. My husband and I own a business in the Northeast Kingdom, so I'm very concerned about our workforce and making sure that they are 
ready and able and sober to work. And recently we became the caregivers for my elderly mother-in-law. Um, and so again, for workforce issues, really concerned about having reliable and sober individuals that we can call on for assistance in her ongoing care. So for those reasons, I thank you very much for inviting me here this morning. So um, you're probably not up on all the latest trends in prevention. So in case you aren't aware, prevention has become a science. Um, and it is round, round, rooted in a lot of evidence base that really shows what we can do to improve conditions so substance use is less likely. And also warns us of things that we shouldn't do that will um, possibly increase substance use disorder and certainly substance use. Um, but while prevention has become a science, it is not a secret. And prevention is everything that we do at home and in our lives to help make our family and friends healthier and safer. And that's what the coalitions do in the state every day. There are 23 coalitions working in their communities to identify risk factors, things that might be contributing to substance use, pulling together a diverse group of partners around the table to come up with strategies to combat those threats and in essence create a community where substance use is less likely. And I'm happy to report that there's you know, evidence that shows it's working, that the communities that have, excuse me, that have coalitions are seeing um, reductions in substance use greater than co excuse me, communities that don't have coalitions. Um, so those 23 coalitions are um, all around the state, uh, does not cover the entire state at this point, but working with those coalitions are thousands of volunteers who are really committed and want to improve conditions in the community. Um, so those things that the volunteers and, and coalitions do include um, educating youth and adults, hosting out of school time activities that are drug and alcohol free, creating local policies that promote health, working with retailers to prevent underage sales of alcohol, tobacco, and the list goes on and on, which is why we say an ounce of prevention is a lot of work. <laughs> so there's a little, uh, little addendum there. But um, research over the last two decades has proven that drug and, uh, drug and alcohol addiction is preventable. And while we're glad to see so many people at the State House lately talking about prevention, let me clearly say that taxation and regulation that allows for commercialization of marijuana is not prevention. It is not good prevention. Prevention Works and Vermont's Prevention Coalitions are opposed to the creation of a commercial system for a retail sales of recreational marijuana and want to clearly refute recent statements that commercialization of marijuana is needed to provide tax dollars for prevention services. It's true that the prevention system in Vermont is underfunded and it does lack the necessary resources to implement effective strategies with enough frequency, intensity, and duration to adequately prevent substance abuse in our communities. But let me say again, taxation and regulation that allows for the commercialization of marijuana is not good prevention. We believe that to support further declines in youth use rates in marijuana, the state must build a solid evidence-based infrastructure aimed at adults and youth to prevent <coughs> marijuana. And again, say focusing on adults as well when it comes to prevention, not just youth. And we'd like to see marijuana use rate, youth use rates be brought to 10% or lower before we embark on a new course for marijuana in the state. Prevention is not just about youth, but it's also about vulnerable adults, including those in recovery. Prevention is not just about providing information and enhancing skills. It's also about modifying policies like S54 so that substance use will be less likely as a result, which is why I'm here to offer my comments on this bill. I know your committee considers matters related to the organization, oversight, and conduct of state government, and it's not a world that I'm well versed in, but I have tried to focus my comments on the topics that most concern your work and not all the concerns that we have with this legislation. So please excuse me if I mention something that you've already addressed in the bill or isn't completely relevant to your work. Based on successful public health strategies like tobacco control, we need marijuana laws that not only prevent or delay first use, but also reduce consumption across the board and encourage current marijuana users to quit, just like our tobacco control program does. We should all be concerned that today, one half of Vermont young adults who report using marijuana also report that they use daily or almost daily. And that is not what most people consider responsible or recreational use. Evidence demonstrates that without a strong public health framework for this work, 
a wealthy and politically powerful marijuana industry will develop and use its political clout to manipulate regulatory frameworks and thwart public health efforts to reduce use, just like has happened with tobacco and alcohol. And I'll just put a plug in there that we have been trying for decades to increase the alcohol tax, the beer tax, and there's a strong industry fighting us on that and not allowing that to happen, and that's a perfect revenue source for prevention money. It's already a substance that's legal, and if that were taxed to keep up with inflation, it would provide um, much needed funds for, for prevention. Can I, can I just ask you, do you know yes. um, if, that, if that tax had kept pace with inflation, what, what the tax rate would be on I have that information, but I don't know off the top of my head. But I can certainly find it. Um, liquor is taxed at 25% of the retail price. And I'm trying to think, beer and wine have two different uh, rates of tax. Um, they are both quite low, and they have not, I can't tell you exactly what they are, but um, they have not gone up since the 1980s. Since the 1980s, mm -hmm. yes. I think wow. it's 1983, does that sound right? right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So right, so just keeping it with inflation. And it wouldn't be a, I don't think it's a tremendous jump. It's not like adding 50 cents or something like that. It's a modest amount, but enough that would provide additional income. OK. I'm a little confused by this rate of inflation, because this is a tax. So the product cost is going up, assuming at the rate of inflation. Mm -hmm. um, so the tax. Even though the tax rate has not increased, the amount of revenue achieved from that tax has increased. That would be true. Yes. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's an apple and oranges thing. I mean, you know, products prices are controlled by inflation. Right. So there's the excise tax. Taxes typically are not. So the excise tax, not the sales tax, right? So isn't that the difference? So I could certainly find that. I can get that information to you when I ask them in my comments. Thank you. Um, so here are some recommendations um, and comments to help build a strong public health framework in this bill. First is concerning the Cannabis Control Board. In S54, the board includes members whose expertise is agriculture, social justice, business management, or regulatory compliance, who are sure to help create a competitive marketplace for businesses, but not protect public health. It's important to expand the membership of the board to include a public health expert since the control board is charged with developing safety materials, product labeling, and employee training requirements. <clears throat> Utilizing a public health framework would include giving the control board power to limit strong THC potency, to set specific testing guidelines for product quality and safety, to set a maximum THC amount per package, not just per serving, limit how many servings, Maybe. Can, can you slow down? Just can you just, it's very hard to take notes. Oh, I'm sorry. And I will send this to you too. So, oh, okay. you want, so, you sorry. Can, so, so you don't have to try and get it off because I think there's a lot. <laughs> but I will email it to you. Or to Kelly. Um, um, a limit on how many servings may be in a single marijuana product. And then also the ability to change the THC limit amounts based on the available and emerging evidence as it becomes um, apparent as we move through this process, so that we don't have to come back to the legislature for a legislature for a legislative change. Yeah. Could you start again? Because, I mean, you can email us us, yeah. but then we can't ask you any questions. Oh, so okay. Capture. <laughs> so this was the... Um, so I got the board the, thing. The, okay, right. No and then public the, health expert. Limit THC amounts. So THC potency, um, setting specific testing guidelines for product quality and safety. Okay. Set a maximum THC amount per package, not just per serving. Okay. And that's also limiting how many servings can be in a packaged product. And then giving the um, board the ability to change the THC limit amounts in products based on merging evidence. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for asking me to read that again. Um, so the second area is advertising, and there's a lot here because a lot of what we do with prevention and public health is around um, advertising um, and um, not normalizing behaviors that we don't want to encourage. So S54 already prohibits marijuana companies from advertising or marketing their products using deceptive, false, or misleading statements or illustrations. 
but the bill fails to include other important restrictions that would prevent marijuana companies from using marketing claims to increase the appeal and safety for their products. So, one of my, so I question that who is charged with judging whether advertising is deceptive, false, or misleading? There's been, you know, through the course of this bill for the past 10 years, who relies on what science and where is the source for making those kinds of decisions, whether or not the advertising is false, deceptive, or misleading? Um, and also whether or not advertising is designed to be or has the effect of being particularly appealing to persons under the age of 21 years. And I think it would be important to stipulate who the, who the body is that's going to make those decisions and if they're making sure they're qualified to make those decisions. Um, so that's another reason why a public health representative has to be on the control board to assist with that. One way to keep marketing in check would be to require that all advertising and marketing statements and claims be evidence-based and approved by the Department of Health, including health-related claims that would increase product appeal. Um, we have a stellar cast of experts at the Vermont Department of Health and we need to use them with helping ferret out some of these things so that people aren't making unreasonable or untrue claims on their products. Experience with tobacco and alcohol control provides a strong public health rationale for reducing the threshold for underage exposure from the 30% that's in the current bill to 15%, as the 30% threshold is an ineffective measure that will permit marijuana companies to place advertisements where youth are likely to be exposed, and possibly more likely to be exposed than adults. Again, this is another lesson that we've learned from tobacco and alcohol. Um, Additional public health strategies that address marketing include limits on sponsorship of sporting events or other entertainment venues. Um, it, could be, it could be decided that those are only venues that um, only 15% or more of the audience is reasonably expected, excuse me, or 15% or more of the audience is not under the age of 21 years. Or better yet, we could just limit it to venues that are adult only if there's going to be advertising inside a Entertainment, entertainment venue or sporting um, venue. Also, um, limitations on third parties, for example, public relation firms or industry um, trade groups that write news pieces or testimonials that are actually ads and who have the effect of promoting marijuana use. So there's nothing in there about who can, who they, who can do the advertising on behalf of the industry. So, um, John has a question. Yes, I'm is, sorry. Has that been done? I, I mean, I see huge First Amendment issues there. Uh, I mean, we put restrictions on where for with the third party piece. Yeah. For that. So, you know what? I don't know. I'm not a legal expert. So, um, it's, it's kind of what's in the recommendations, but I'm not sure if it's been done before. I don't know how you could pro prohibit somebody from publishing. Yeah. I think if they were if they were connected to the industry, though, I mean, I'm not sure if there's any restrictions that could be if they were a hired public relations firm for, you know, a retailer or um, of the trade industry being able to market on behalf of the, the Maryland okay. establishments. I'm not sure, but it would be great if we could. Okay. Um, another recommendation is to not allow tax deductions for advertising and marketing in order to increase the cost that the marijuana establishments um, have for promotional activity that would also help limit advertising if they couldn't deduct, couldn't deduct those costs. Um, also a recommendation that we require marijuana companies to report to the Department of Health all paid advertising expenditures, including price discounting and incentives, promotional allowances, payments to retailers and wholesalers, and contributions to elected officials. These laws are important to promote government transparency and to discourage industry payments to professionals, much like we saw the pharmaceutical industry do with physicians. Um, and then reports of this data could then be um, available, or could be made publicly available as well to help with the transparency issue. Um, internet advertising in this bill is prohibited, but it's not clearly defined. So effective public health legislation would define digital advertising explicitly and include, but not be limited to, text messaging, Instagram, Facebook, pop-up ads online, mobile ads or apps, or other new age advertising platforms in which those under 21 might download or use. The way to protect youth most effectively and prevent advertising that encourages excessive or abusive use 
would be to allow retail marijuana advertising only inside licensed adult-only retail outlets that sell retail marijuana and marijuana products. Um, yeah, let's get that part. So, um, so that was advertising. Um, so the next section is labeling and packaging. Um, and so I don't have a ton here, but that uh, recommendations that the package not contain any false or misleading statements, um, which include health claims, and also the term organic, which in itself indicates that a product is safer or healthier than the non-organic alternative, which is not necessarily true, especially since you addressed pesticides um, in this bill. So it wouldn't, that could be a marketing term that's not really useful to the consumer. Also, we recommend um, language that talks about child-resistant packaging. Also, that the label information on the packages must be unobstructed and conspicuous. And then warnings about use by women who are pregnant, concluded in the morning statements. Mm -hmm. um, so now on to licensing. So licensing restrictions should include limits on retailer density and require licensed facilities to be prohibited within 1,000 feet of locations that are frequented by youth, young adults, and vulnerable adults, and be required to be at least 1,000 feet from other retail licensed locations. If you choose to use the definition of a school in the licensing, the school must include educational establishments where at least 75% of the population are younger than 21 to include colleges and universities. <coughs> no one under minimum age should be allowed in any store that sells marijuana, and you've already made that distinction for staff, um, but also probably for patrons that they're not bringing their kids with them. Um, S54 has a limit on the amount of product per transaction, but no mention on the number of transactions per day. So we might not be able to prevent sales at multiple outlets, but we can limit the number of transactions per person per outlet. S54 offers the option of a licensee conducting its own training programs on its premises using information and materials furnished by the board. I suggest we don't include that recommendation. The Department of Liquor Control that's been doing retailer trainings for alcohol and tobacco for a very, very long time um, has data that shows retailer training conducted by, um, a, license, by a certified educator. Um, the compliance rate is far higher than, any, than, the, um, than the education that's done in store by store owners. Um, and there are ways to provide incentives for store owners to get their employees there for employees to take that training although you may not need one for this bill. Um, but we um, definitely feel that the owner trained um, part of that, the owner provided training should not be an option. They should be required to attend a training that's um, offered by a, like, by a trained um, educator. And I also didn't see anywhere in their um, language for penalties for selling to youth. Um, and I'm not sure where that would fall into the licensing section, but making it very clear that that will not be tolerated and what the penalties are if somebody is found um, that they are supplying to young people. <clears throat> so the next section wasn't particularly part of the, part of the bill, but I'm just calling it communities. Um, and it's regarding the opt-in, opt-out clause for municipalities um, around whether or not they allow marijuana sales and um, establishments in their community. We recommend that the bill include an opt-in clause for municipalities, not opt-out, and that's for two reasons. One, if someone opens a business before the town can hold a meeting to consider this option, they're grandfathered by the law, which means they ultimately don't have a choice or a say in this, um, in this, in this policy. But it also, by having the opt-out clause, it also puts an undue burden on public health advocates to launch the community conversation instead of the commercial interest being responsible for making sure a community um, is going to welcome their endeavors. And so we very highly, very strongly um, ask that that be um, changed to an opt-in clause. Finally, we request that you include a statement that nothing in the bill should be construed that the state encourages or endorses marijuana use, and in fact recognizes the potential danger that marijuana use may pose to some users and also include a disclaimer that employers, landlords, and licensing bodies maintain discretion to enforce their own regulations as far as the use, possession, and cultivation of marijuana by employees, tenants, and licensees. 
I hope that you agree that we ultimately want fewer people using marijuana, especially young people. Your committee can address and prevent the emerging and future public health problems associated with marijuana use by preventing the growth of another large industry similar to the tobacco and alcohol industries by letting this bill die or creating a strong public health focused regulatory system modeled on the Vermont Tobacco Control Program that would minimize social normalization and discourage the use of marijuana. Thank you. Questions committee? <coughs> So what have been some of the most effective um, education and prevention strategies that you and your organization put in place? So I would say um, for, well, I think one of the most effective was when um, alcohol use rates were sky high in the state and there were a lot of young people dying on the highways. And we had a very large concerted campaign targeted to parents and stores about the risks and liabilities of supplying alcohol to youth. Um, and it really created a huge norm change in the community. The ways that youth used to access alcohol changed. And at that point, there were a lot of programs and opportunities available to people to get um, information and training. And many of those programs that we relied on back then in the 90s no longer exist. The funding for those has been, um, has been cut. So um, that was one way that was very, very, very important for us to be able to talk to parents and other adults about why supplying to youth um, and to minors was, um, was not in their best interest. And then ultimately creating laws that made it not in the adult's best interest to supply because there were penalties associated with that. And so Ginny Burley, who's one of my colleagues, is here as well. She works with the Central Vermont New Directions Coalition. Is there anything that you would add as another strategy? Well, there's, there was some federal policy around advertising and, and what you can put on television uh, and football games and that sort of thing that youth are watching. Um, with tobacco, there is an option, uh, or with all, all uh, retail products, there's the option of what we call content neutral advertising, where you can't remove advertising for one particular substance, but you can limit the amount of space on your window that is devoted to advertising, and in many cases that's actually a public safety um, asset as well because people can see inside the store if there's anything going on, and people in the store can see out to the parking lot if there's anything going on. So there's there's various policy options. What, what really worked with tobacco was all that money from the settlement was used for major education programs. Um, the, 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 you've probably seen a lot of those ads with, with the, the person with who's lost their voice, and the woman, the, 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 the one that breaks my heart right now is that the English guy who says, I'm going to be dead by the time you see this ad. And those are very powerful and very effective, so effective that the industry turned to e-cigarettes as their next market, and in two years, we were up to 30% use among youth. So they're, they're very powerful, um, they're motivated by profit, and they really don't give two hoots about and I will say, um, when Lori talked about the opt-in, one of my jobs is to, I have all the towns in Washington County under my jurisdiction. Some of them don't even have a zoning board. I mean, this is just not easy for small towns to be able to compete with the money and the um, savvy of big marijuana corporations. They don't, they don't know what to do. We're, we're trying to tell them as fast as we can. If you don't want it here, then here's what you have to do. But three of my towns don't even have a town plan right now. Um, so this is, they're not sophisticated, and it's really hard on them, and we're doing the best we can, but they're, they can't compete with the industry. Go ahead, Joe. Well, I, I, first of all, I just want to really thank you for the time you took looking at the bill and coming up with comments um, about what we could pr propose, or you, you would propose that, that we modify um, the bill. I mean, it, it's really good to hear a lot of ideas. Um, I just had a couple questions about some of them, just to, to fill them out more so I better understand them. Um, you said ses setting testing guidelines, and, and there is testing in the bill. Is there something more, more specific that needs to be done in the bill? That is not my area of expertise, but I know one of the things is allowing the board the ability 
the flexibility to do that so they don't have to come back for legislative approval in order to, you know, a new test becomes available or we identify some new foreign matter in the marijuana that we need to test for fentanyl, right? Or, you know, whatever else might be there that somehow is a new level of something that we need to test for, that there's the flexibility of the board to be able to respond. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so, the, the, I mean, with respect to advertising, you said who decides on what's false and misleading? I mean, that, that's an issue with respect to any type of advertising. I mean, it's a very common uh, term in statute um, with respect to all types of advertising. I mean, you know, and ultimately the Cannabis Control Board, as this bill is currently written, would be responsible um, or whoever they decide, you know, is going to be their enforcement arm is going to be responsible for making those determinations. I, I mean, so do you have a specific concern there? Because I mean, this is a very common, false and misleading advertising right. is definitely illegal virtually in every industry across the United States. So, and there's somebody, enforcement arm, that's taking that up. So is there something more that? I guess making sure that it's really, um, Felt out who that who that body is, and that there's a public health person that's involved, or a public health team that's involved, not just industry folks or business-focused people or um, people that are currently listed on the board. But there's somebody there who understands the science, understands public health, not just individual, you know, people that may benefit individually from from um, this law, um, and making sure that it's spelled out. I mean, one of my big frustrations was when. Um, the health impact study came out from the Department of Health, but any new study comes out, there's the people who are saying, like, this is the greatest thing, you know, that we've seen in years, and other people will say, like, that's all BS. And so what, who, who's gonna be the person, you know, who's gonna be the judge to say, this is the evidence we're going to use. This is the body of knowledge that we're going to go to to help support our decision making. And that might be important for the board to decide that ahead of time too, before there's an issue in front of them saying, is this misleading advertising that they agree that they're going to use the CDC guidelines for what is appropriate advertising? Or are they going to use guidelines from the, you know, um, some other health organization or some other um, place? But I think that might be important to spell that out before it ends up on somebody's desk and then now we're making decisions who the governing body or governing body of knowledge is going to be. Does the CDC have false and misleading guidelines? They have guidelines around advertising for alcohol and tobacco, but I don't know if they I don't know if it specifically says false and misleading. Okay. Um, sticking with advertising, um, you said all claims need to be evidence based. So I assume you're trying to get at, you know, looking at what medical marijuana dispensaries currently do, they'll, they'll usually have, you know, pro whatever the product name is, which are all weird names, um, and then they'll say, you know, our patients have told us that this is good for PTSD, anxiety, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Is that a concern of yours, that those sort of... It is of a concern for me, because when I go to the pharmacy, it doesn't have a list that says, you know, Zoloft, my patients tell me it's good for this, this, and this, right? Your physician tells you whether or not well, it's or good Or TV for advertising. Well, TV <laughs> advertising, right, exactly, exactly. So I think, yeah, I think it's problematic to base somebody's, if it's a medical decision, solely on the evidence of, you know, oh, so-and-so tried it and it worked for them, so, you know, I will try that. I think there needs to be a little bit, I think this needs to be tightened up. Um, and there is some of that research, right, that's being, I mean, there is apparently research that's being done to prove that certain strains might be good for certain ailments, right? I'm assuming that's happening in the right. field. But, but. but, you know, my only, just being devil's yeah. advocate for a minute, is if, if there is no description for all these various strains, you know, we just, you know, it just says, okay, this is sativa, you know, THC content of 22%, CBD content of zero. And, and people want to know whether they should have strain A or strain B or strain C. There's not much guidance there except the THC level or the CBD level. So I guess my, my frustration is that that whole system wasn't really developed very medically. So I've become very astute with medication stuff lately because we're watching, we're taking care of my mother-in-law. And all that information you get from the pharmacy says what it's indicated for, you know, what potential uses could be. But it doesn't say, my patients say, you know, you might want to try this because this will help. I mean, there's some more science there to help make those decisions. To, to be the devil's advocate, yeah. though, all of that 
um, packaging material that you get with your pharmaceuticals is uh, is developed by the companies that are profiting off of our consumption of those pharmaceuticals. So to, to say that it is completely um, uh, without bias, I think, is not quite there. Okay, thank you, Scott. Go ahead. Oh, Sorry. I think Bob had a question, so I have more. Skip. So okay, go ahead, Bob. Ahead. We'll come ahead. back to John in a moment. What you're just talking about now, I mean, I go to the Auto Master and they have a little bulletin board that has testimonials. They did a great brake job or something like that. It's a difference, I think, between uh, testimonials and medical fact. Is there any jurisdiction that completely outlaws advertising at this point? And did I hear you say that at least one group? Pre-approved everything that went two different ways. So, like advertising had to be screened for use. Great. I'm not. I'm not aware offhand. I didn't do that research before I wrote these comments, so I don't know. But I certainly could find out from folks on the national level like who has enacted some of those restrictions. Um, I know that there's you know problems about tying the hands of the industry behind their back when it comes to advertising because they've got their own level of free speech rights, right, as a, as a corporation, which is why we need to be really careful about this because once we let it out of the gate, it's going to be really hard to control it. So to really be, I guess, cognizant of what those limitations can and should be and maybe being more restrictive in the beginning and giving ourselves the ability to loosen it up later on as opposed to trying to rail it back in, reel it back in later. Well, um, you've used the cigarette alcohol comparison watch, and that's certainly something that's been limited. Right, right, exactly, exactly, it has been very limited. So there certainly are limitations, I'm not sure how that works. Part of the tobacco limitations were because of the master settlement agreement, so that was it, you know, enforced on them. And again, I'm not an expert in corporate law, so I'm not exactly sure you know, who could come back and sue the state or sue a municipality for not allowing them to market the way they want to. I don't know the legal um, jargon that goes along with all that or the ramifications. But important for you to know as we move forward. Follow up? <clears throat> so uh, this is a pretty broad question, but if could you t give us an idea of how much it would cost to have a comprehensive public education and prevention program put together? I know you are familiar with um, the tobacco settlement and during their heyday when they were actually getting money from the settlement mm -hmm. to, to do prevention. Um, any idea what they were spending? So I don't know what they were spending, but I'm going to defer to Dr. Levine's comments because I'm pretty certain in his comments he identified a number. And for some okay. reason I'm thinking it's six million, but I don't know that that's a, I don't know that that's the right number. I can't remember what he said, but I would I would ask you to look at his comments because he he has looked at not just the prevention coalitions and the work that we're doing, but the school based piece and the prevention consultants that are in each district and on and on and on of the the other services that ADAP is providing. And so I would I would want to use his number. Um, so the way that spirits are sold in Vermont, basically the only advertising is once you get into the, in the door. Um, and I think you indicated that that would be a, if we were going to go a retail route, that would be a preferable um, uh, type of setup. Uh, I know that in the liquor stores they have descriptions of what the product is so that people can look at these signs and say this is something you know that meets my needs or what I'm looking for. Um, they're not particularly scientific, uh, but it's not, not making any claims either. It just says this is where this is made, this is what it's made from. Um, is that? Mm -hmm. advertising that, that might be okay? I think so. I mean, I think using that as a model makes a lot of sense that what we've done a lot of work on 
of um, alcohol and tobacco control. And so being if there's a model like that that already exists that we could emulate, I think that makes perfect sense. And also, I mean, I really like the idea of limiting the advertising because part of this bill when it all came to the forefront was we're providing a service to people who are already smoking marijuana and they don't want it to be legal anymore, right? We shouldn't be promoting it. We shouldn't be encouraging people to use. It's not good for them, it be, especially because of the way our society promotes things, that it's overuse. It's not, like I said, you know, half of the young adults who are, who are using regularly are using daily or nearly daily. That's troublesome. Um, so, um, and I know folks at UVM will say the same thing for the students that are there, that it's a troublesome thing and it's something they're worried about. So if there are a way that somebody was interested in procuring, in this case, spirits or marijuana, you know, they would, they would know where to go and they would go and it's not marketing to creating new audiences much like Big Tobacco did, right? It's not about encouraging people to come into the store. They've already made up the decision and then they go there and then whatever advertising or marketing is there is, you know, to them once they've walked in the door. It's available to them once they walk into the door, but it's not about finding new customers and building business um, because that's not what this, how this conversation started, if I recall correctly. Thank you. So we are close to time, so I've got Hal and then John, if you had any other sure. follow-up. Go ahead, Hal. So I'm a parent with three grown children, and I learned that during the work week, 3 to 6 p.m. was a pretty iffy, tricky time. Um, so how important is it for this education and prevention effort to provide programming um, during that slot? And any ideas of what that might cost? Is that in the six million that the Commissioner of Health is suggesting for? So I'm not, um, I don't know where that, if that number is included in Dr. Levine's comments or not. Um, Holly Morehouse, who works with the after school um, folks in Vermont, has a number of what the robust, um, robust after school programming would look like and cost for kids across the board, not just younger children, but even high school kids, how do we provide programming that's engaging um, for them. We do know that that's a really risky time, and so being able to provide um, meaningful activities um, that keep kids distracted, but also involved in something meaningful, not just you know policing them or babysitting them for, mm -hmm. for those hours, is vitally important. Um, and certainly part of the prevention conversation um, when we talk about when we talk about um, prevention on the whole, it isn't just about what happens in a school or what happens at home. There's this other space that Holly talks about, the third space. So we need to look at what kids are learning and what they're doing during school, when they're with their family, and when they're um, at home. Wait, at home, at school, and then outside the home. Everything um, else. Everything else. <laughs> thank you. So did I answer? Yes. Okay. Thank you, John. Any follow-ups? Um, no, you're fine. Yes. So uh, this is current law. That's under um, Title 18. The dispensing of marijuana to a person under 21 is a criminal offense. So it, it is in law. It's um, already there. Okay. Great. Does it bear repeating in this particular piece around the, the penalties for a licensee who is identified as supplying oh, to you? Oh, from that aspect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we can bring that up with uh, with our drafts person when she gets yeah. back. So thank you so much for uh, for your detailed um, view of the bill and and your perspective on robust prevention programs. Well, thank you again for inviting me, and I will send this on so you have all the have all my text. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you. All right, now we have Jessa Barner from the Vermont New Medical Society. Thank Hello. you. Good morning. Thank you, Jessa Barnard. I'm the executive director of the Vermont Medical Society. We represent about 2,000 physicians across the state of various uh, specialties and private practice, as well as working in hospitals. And I'm also speaking today on behalf of the American Academy of Pediatrics Vermont chapter, which represents about 225 pediatricians across the state. And I think you couldn't have timed our testimony better because we didn't plan this, but we have a lot of parallels um, with supporting Lori's comments. Um, uh, and, and agree with all of her recommendations as well. And I do, I did submit this in writing. I don't know if you want me to pull it up. Should I do it on here? Do I need to do anything to get it? Nice job. 
job now since jumping in when Jim's mm -hmm. done. <laughs> <laughs> Just handed it to you, assuming you're the closest, you might know it. Okay. Hit refresh the page. Hit refresh. Um, so this is an order of the bill. I know you're close to work up and wants and specific language is helpful. So I've gone in order of where these items fall in the bill. I will say they are not necessarily in order of our um, priority because our, the one that comes last is actually our top priority, which is sustainable funding for comprehensive prevention programs. So we'll get back to that at the end. And I do have some specific dollar amounts uh, we can talk about when I get to that point. Um, but I will absolutely reiterate what Lori said, which is our support also for having a public health representative on the board. I listed out the, and I think this was what Lori was referencing as well, the number of, of tasks that the board is asked to do in S54 and the areas of rule they're asked to draft that have public health implications. So I don't need to go through all of these, but around advertising and signage, health and safety requirements additives to cannabis, sanitary requirements, testing, labeling, um, packaging, length of time it takes for the product to take effect on labels, um, a, create a safety information flyer, and then finally basically rewriting the entire regulatory structure for the medical cannabis registry. Um, so the board has a lot under their purview that has health and safety implications, and I, I really don't see how that work is possible without a public health expert uh, participating in that conversation, as well as a close relationship with the Department of Health and Department of Public Safety and the entities that have been doing a lot of this work um, already, especially around the medical cannabis registry. So we strongly believe a board member with expertise in public health is necessary, and it's a little bit not as central to our work, but I know there's been some conversation in this committee around a public safety member on the board, and we support that as well. Um, we're ag agnostic in terms of the details of who appoints these members or how the board is structured. We support a five-member board. We work very closely with the Green Mountain Care Board on a lot of other health regulatory issues and just see that that number of people brings a breadth and depth of experience that may not be possible on a three-member board. Um, so that would also be our, our recommendation, but again, specifically um, really critical to have a public health um, input in that work. So this was just our, our suggested language, but again, it was a little bit random that we put one more in the House and one more in the Senate. Um, I really support um, the whole conversation you had with Lori around the restrictions on advertising to youth. We absolutely <coughs> agree with her comment that this should not be about marketing to new users or, or creating more users like we've seen the tobacco and alcohol industry are experts at doing. Um, we, we see the, again, we've heard the conversation that this, the legislature is looking at this as sort of a harm reduction. Let's make the current use safer and more regulated, like regulated. So let's not be creating a new generation of users who are being promoted to. Um, our most specific recommendation is to um, remove the provision that allows mass marketing based on the percent of audience who are likely to be youth. I just I think we've learned from alcohol and tobacco that is very hard to um, monitor and enforce. And as Lori pointed out, there's really no enforcement structure put in place to ensure the compliance with these requirements. We have, you know, our experience, um, for example, right now, we're working with the Attorney General's office on an issue around um, stem cell clinics, so totally different topic, but coming under that blanket of deceptive false advertising, that's really, but that takes some, an enforcement agency taking action, it takes complaints, it takes then the Attorney General's office deciding they're interested or that it violates their laws, that's expensive for the state to enforce. Um, we know again with the tobacco industry, it took billions of dollars of litigation to get to the regulations we have in place now and to get uh, the best compliance we have with them. So um, I, we agree with Lori, let's keep it as narrow as possible to begin with. And our real big concern is around this, what we call mass marketing. So billboards, flyers, television, radio, internet. I actually, I, um, I'm not sure, I know Lori mentioned that internet um, advertising is not allowed. My understanding is it's actually internet sales that are not allowed, but that the link, current language would allow internet advertising if based on the percent of audience. But I don't know how you monitor that. I mean, kids have access to, everything these days. And so I think that, and I think 30%, especially given our demographics of Vermont, is almost, I think almost anything, any, I don't know the details on this, but very many things could be viewed by an audience, um, by youth that, that are, that meets that 30% threshold. 
Um, and just to address a couple of the questions that came up um, or with Lori's testimony, my, our comments, at least around the advertising, are specific to the commercial sales. Uh, my understanding in the bill is that there is a separate section where the board would be responsible for coming up with advertising regulations for the dispensaries. So I'm not sure it's necessary that they would be identical. For example, what could be listed in the dispensary um, or in a low sales location for a, a dispensary versus commercial sales. So I think those could be distinguished based on um, the different markets. Um, also, just a comment that the, those, and so get a little off topic, but those package inserts that you get with pharmaceuticals are actually FDA approved. So there is a whole regulatory structure around they've approved it for specific indications, and then they actually look at that whole package insert and make sure that it's evidence based and only talking about the approved indications. So um, there's a whole very complex regulatory structure around that. And I am not a First Amendment expert, but my understanding is that because marijuana at the federal level is an illegal substance, the First Amendment rights um, conversation is different. And that, that I would encourage you to hear from experts on sort of advertising law, but I, un, my understanding is that you don't necessarily need to give the same latitude to an illegal substance as you would um, other legal um, entities. We're concerned by the potency and forms of cannabis, and this is, sorry, this is a little bit spread between two pages here, but um, we, we know from both um, media reports as well as published um, article, uh, articles that a lot of the concerns in other states with emergency department visits and overdoses are from either very high potency inhaled forms of marijuana or children getting into edibles, either intentionally or unintentionally. And there have been a lot of news um, stories lately about kids bringing them to school, whether they know or don't know what's in them, and then whole classrooms getting sick and going to the emergency department. Um, and there was a, a pretty, a very recent study um, in uh, Colorado looking at ED visits, and again, they found that um, even though edibles were a low percent of sales total, they were a high percent of what caused um, especially children, but like emergency department visits because people don't know how potent they are. They, it's not taking effect right away, so they eat more and more. Um, and also these concern about these really high potency um, inhaled versions. So because of, of those concerns, we actually we have seen, um, and you may be aware of this, I don't know if you've had testimony on this already, but Washington State, for example, has re-examined all of its rules regarding edible products, and they have a whole lot of detail that they're now looking at. Um, that they will actually review edibles for appearance, color, shape, packaging, and other factors to ensure they're not appealing to youth. Um, it's very hard, you know, gummy candies, you know, if you look at uh, cotton candy, lollipops, I mean, it, it, kid, the, this is exactly what kids want to eat. Um, and so we would recommend, I mean, our, at least a simple way to address this is that you've already asked the um, cannabis board to look at regulation of addit additives to cannabis to make sure they're not toxic, more addictive, or appealing to um, youth under the age of 21, we would encourage the board to also um, be allowed to do rulemaking around the potency and forms of cannabis so that they can look at should there be restrictions on potency, what forms can it take, are edibles, what forms can edibles take. Again, Washington State has said certain colors, or maybe it can be a neutral color, brown, whatever, um, but not yellow, orange, looking really fun. So we, we think, um, again, if you have a public health member on the board, that's a great role for the board to really look at um, what do, do we allow these or not? Um, this is mo changing gears to the cannabis registry and the, the medical cannabis system. Um, and I know you've had some testimony on how the system works currently. What S54 is asking for basically a complete rewrite or letting the board really look at that whole system and how it will be regulated. We have we have some concerns with that approach. We actually think our medical registry is working pretty well, all things considered. It's, it's well structured, it's well regulated. We haven't heard concerns about um, misuse or diversion. Um, and we feel like it is the, the providers know what's expected of them when filling out the paperwork. The patients know what's expected of them. Um, one of our biggest concerns, um, to sort of pick, pick one that we would hope could be addressed in S54, is the elimination of the requirement for a bona fide healthcare professional patient relationship before someone can fill out the paperwork. So that's found in current statute in the definitions. There's a definition of a bona fide healthcare provider relationship. It generally requires a three month relationship. So you have to know this provider over some period of time. And there are exceptions um, for patients who have newly moved into the state or recently changed healthcare providers or if you've just been diagnosed with something. 
Um, and our concern for the elimination of this is that you will see, and we know this because there have been news reports of entities trying to come into Vermont except finding this a barrier, that you'll just have marijuana, we call them marijuana mills. I, I've lived in California, I've lived in Maine, I've seen this in both of those states where you walk in, you pay $200 to get your exam, and you walk out with your card that day, and you never see that provider again. And the concern about that is there's no follow-up, there's no monitoring for system, for um, out side effects, or is this helping you, is this not helping you? Um, and so we do think there should be some ongoing meaningful relationships, some ability to come back to see this provider if you're having bad outcomes or want more information. Um, so our suggestion would be, again, you've asked the cannabis board to really adopt rules about the whole administration of the chapter around uh, medical use, and we think that the rules should establish some standards for a bona fide healthcare professional patient relationship. Maybe the three months isn't the cleanest way to go about doing that, but there needs to be some um, requirement that there be a, this be a true healthcare provider patient relationship and not just somebody you're seeing to get a card. I would also think that there'd be some interest in that just on the concern that this would be an easy way to evade taxation. If you want a lower cost product, you simply go this route, um, say you have a bad headache and you get somebody to fill out the form and then you can get it cheaper by going to the dispensary side of things rather than the commercial side of things. So I just think from a regulatory perspective that would make um, sense. And then to our, our main piece, and I won't um, reiterate all the great testimony you heard from Lori about sustainable funding and what we know works from prevention. Again, as Lori said, it, it is a science now. We know prevention can work. We know how to do prevention. Our Department of Health and all the regional and community partners do a great job in this. We've, we saw, we've seen such huge strides in areas like tobacco that we are now seeing with funding plateauing, that our youth tobacco rate is also plateauing, so we know funding and a, and a robust program is very important. And we believe that a tax and regulate scheme for cannabis must direct dedicated, sustained funding to imp implement comprehensive strategies throughout the state. Our recommendation is for $6 million, and that comes from, um, I, I believe you may have seen this from Dr. Levine, but there was a lot of work done from the prevention subcommittee of the governor's um, subcommittee this summer. And that six million is actually only a portion. It's actually a fairly small portion of what they're asked, what they asked for overall. But that funds the um, what they call their um, regional prevention networks, and that's to really do the on the ground in the community work around um, after school programming and youth leadership. So the Icelandic model that you may have heard of, and and that three to six p.m. time meaningful, um, evidence based after school programming, some local educational counter marketing campaigns working on local public health policies and gathering and evaluating local data. Um, it does not include, so portions of what they recommended that it would actually not fund is school-based prevention um, counselors. That's an additional cost, as well as some areas around research and evaluation. But um, that's at least sort of our, um, I would say, minimal or modest piece of the request that we think is the most important um, to do statewide prevention campaigns. Um, and we think that should make sure that that's clear that that's annual and that that will be an ongoing source of funding for prevention work around the state. Um, and I think I actually skipped this. I just wanted to mention that we also support the uh, municipalities um, having a, an opt-in rather than opt-out of sales um, since we know that location density of retail outlets has an impact on use and it also I think municipalities should be able to have the choice over their local culture of health and whether they think this contributes or doesn't contribute to it. And without having that choice, you risk having um, locations going into the most um, vulnerable, disadvantaged, and dis less organized um, communities in the state um, who may not be able to voice their opinion on whether they, they want the sales in their location or not. Um, so I think those were all of my points. Thank you for your patience and hearing. Let me go, go through all this. I'm happy to answer. Any questions? I appreciate you bringing us recommended language as well. Since Thank you. Uh, we are at that point. I know you're you're getting, you're getting really getting down to the, the yes. work here, so we wanted to help it be yes. as easy as possible. Very helpful. Thank you. JP. I was going to, I was going to say, say a thing about the language. I appreciate that. But I have a question for you, is, and I should have asked for it as well. <clears throat> are you current? I realize what you guys are doing. This is a big thing for me. Should this become law? is the education and prevention efforts, especially for our youth. Mm -hmm. So are you folks, both you and Lori, your organizations, are you currently working 
to the best of your ability right now with youth organizations that are with current youth organizations that are already established in, in municipalities. In, in my in my in my town, I represent Milton, so I'm going to simply say the Milton Youth Coalition. So are you guys, both of you, uh, there you inquire, um, working with youth organizations such as that currently working with them? I think that would probably be the best question for the prevention coalitions. I know marijuana, we are, our state already has some of the highest youth rates of marijuana use in the country, so right. we know it's a problem already. So I guess my high level answer would say yes. I mean, I know the prevention coalitions, the Department of Health, is well aware of the problem, trying to do everything they can. I think, honestly, the funding is the limit, limiting factor in terms of how much can be done on sort of an organized statewide basis. But yes, I mean, I think it, there is work happening. Well, before they answer, I'd really yeah. like to hear what the Vermont Medical Society is doing. We work very closely with the American Academy of Pediatrics, and they are doing a lot of state work statewide around sort of youth and child resilience and working with parents and communities to connect, to screen youth for um, ACEs, so any risks and vulnerability factors in their family, and then refer to community resources, um, make sure kids are connected to you know, activities and, and um, interventions as, as needed. So I would say that's sort of a direct piece of what, um, especially the pediatricians are very actively working on. Stephanie actually is the executive director of the American Academy of Pediatrics, so could probably even give more detail. Um, so physicians every day are working on prevention, you know, screening and working on prevention. There was actually a bill um, that came out of Senate Health and Welfare around screening, improving screening for the um, ACEs, they call it sort of early childhood adverse events, um, and making sure that families who are sort of at risk are connected um, to services where we work. We've supported um, early home visiting, nurse home visits, making sure family, there's somebody checking in on, on families with a new child and getting them connected to services. Well, but the medical profession doesn't have a good history in prevention, given their involvement in the opioid crisis, which was and started with prescription drugs prescribed by medical professionals. Yes, and I will, I, I will say that one of the reasons opioid use was prescribed so highly was because it was very effective marketing by very well-funded commercial entities. And so that's actually a concern we see being repeated here. We don't want to repeat the opioid crisis. I think physicians have come a long way. I would really encourage you to hear from the Department of Health about how prescribing rates have gone down. There are very strict rules around prescribing. And we don't want to be part of perpetuating that kind of a problem. And I will say that um, we absolutely agree there needs to be more evidence and education for prescribers around marijuana. And that evidence is limited and it's just emerging. And actually, the, um, there's an out of University of Vermont Medical Center, there's what's called the Academic Detailing Program um, that it, uh, goes around and educates prescribers about best practices in a number of areas. They're called counter detailing because they, their job is to go around and counter the pharmaceutical detailers who are trying to convince prescribers to do the, prescribe the highest cost brand name medication. And they are developing a module or a topic right now around marijuana. Because regardless of what happens with F54, patients are using marijuana for medical, non-medical, commercial reasons. So it has to be something that physicians are prepared to have that conversation with their patients around, regardless of what happens with this bill. So we, we are, do, we've done educational sessions for our members at our annual meeting, and we've done webinars around the evidence on marijuana and what it may help, what the side of, you know, what the problems with it may be. So education and, and being able to do research and have evidence-based um, data to talk about with prescribers is very important and something that we do. So what most concerned you about S-54 as it's written? I think our, our, our underlying concern with the whole premise is putting a financial incentive to promote more use of marijuana. Because you're, you're creating an industry that their profit motive comes from more users and, and frequent users. We know in other states that 80% of the sales are to 20% of users. So they are getting basically a, people who are addicted are their biggest customer. So their profit motive is to create more people who are addicted. I think if we were to start, if, if we were saying Vermont's going this direction, 
we know I mean, that's the, that's a given. What would VMS sort of how would VMS is our organization structure it? I think we look at a either a co-op model, a nonprofit model, a model like um, in the Dutch coffee shop model. They actually don't have legal sales. They allow illegal sales if they comply with a whole bunch of regulatory requirements. So that if the coffee shop violates those requirements, they just pull their sort of exemption to um, to uh, prosecuting for illegal sales. So you haven't created an industry that has a sort of a legal um, standing to oppose those regulations. So there are ways, and actually there's a RAN, there's a good 2016 RAN report that for, written for Vermont on how sort of the incentives created by all these different types of models for selling it. So I think there, there are models, again, if we were to wave our magic wand and be, have, be able to write the bill ourselves, um, there are models that, that are less likely to promote high use. But that said, we know the, the, what you're working off of, and these are our, <laughs> and these are our recommendations for S54 as written. In the context of both your conversations, you talked about limiting uh, potency. Mm -hmm. Just in the market of edibles and other non-bud smoking or universal? I think it should be universal. I, I think the risk is lower. In, and again, I'm not an expert in cannabis science. My mm -hmm. understanding is that the risk would be lower for, say, the smoked bud, that they, they don't reach the same percentages of THC potency as, say, the um, Distilled kind of vape liquid or the edible, and, and well, an edibles is different. It may not even be the potency per serving, but the fact that people don't feel it as quickly, so they eat more of it. Um, so I think it should be applied to all products. There should be um, potency limits. Any other questions, JP? Hi, uh, and this goes for you as well, Lori. And I apologize for not getting when you were up here, but I got a little behind. <laughs> In my note taken. <laughs> We're talking about funding again. Mm. Or excuse me, now I'm gonna talk about funding. My my first question to you folks was, are you working with the local youth coalitions and things like that to the best of your ability? And I realize it's it depends on funding available and things like that. But right now is where are you you both your organizations getting getting your funding, your money to do this? Where are you getting it from? We are to a, a, a voluntary membership association. So we get all basically almost 100% of our budget from member dues. So members decide we are a valuable organization to belong to. They pay us a membership fee, and then we do you know we work on a number of different activities, priorities, um, different advocacy in the state house. And that's very. The prevention coalitions are more sort of nonprofit, probably grant driven, but they can speak right. themselves to their their funding okay. to do the prevention work and. The, Oh, no. so, so the prevent you actually so the prevention coalitions receive some state funding, federal funding often local funding. Prevention works receives funding from the coalitions and also from ADAP um, to do the work that we're doing, the outreach work that we do. Um, but the coalitions on the ground, it's a mixture. There, you know, there was tobacco money and there was special alcohol prevention money for twelve to fifteen year olds, and then there's the federal funding and then it's just everything that gets cobbled together, um, and there's never a reliable source to be able to say, well, at least we can keep a quarter time staff person, you know, throughout and go figure out how to pay for programming or other additional staff people. And that's hard because you spend, some of the grants are three or five years, which is awesome, but it takes that long to build the relationships you need in order to create change in the community. I mean, we're talking about creating a culture that doesn't encourage substance use. So it takes that long to develop relationships then a coalition loses their funding, and all of that work and all of that trust that went into building that is gone. So that when the next group comes back, it's that much harder for them to get started because everybody's been burned once already that they invested. Mm -hmm. um, and the Melbourne Youth Coalition is a member coalition of Prevention Works, um, and um, just sort of, oh, and I know all the coalitions work really well to outreach to youth and youth-serving organizations. Um, there's always room for improvement. I'm sure there's some groups that we're missing, um, but they do their best. And often, oftentimes in communities, the coalition is the only youth-serving organization in town if it's a small town or an underserved community. Okay, thank you. And, and that is just one of my big issues. It should be, you know, it's 54 become law, is that there's adequate funding for, for this purpose. That's one of my biggest concerns. 
that, that of course, in, in the public safety aspect of it. But and we that, share that with you. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I obviously do based on my yeah. previous career, but the thing of it is, is that is really important to me, is that there's sufficient funding to, to support these efforts. I agree, and, I, and it, from our perspective, at least sort of watching the conversations happen over the, not just this session, but the past several sessions, is that has seemed to be one of the whole motivations for a tax and regulate system as opposed to grow your own. I mean, right, a home grow is that then there would be revenue to fund prevention. Um, and so if this all happens without funding for prevention, it seems, at least to us, to kind of be the worst possible outcome for the state. Thank you. Any other questions for Jessa? Can I have one comment in relation to that? So yes, go ahead. Um, I didn't address funding at all in my in my presentation um, because I feel like it's this sticky wicket for prevention um, to be asking for money from a bill that we really have a lot of, of, of problems with. But if that is going to move forward and you're working on language for funding prevention, I think it really needs to model the way you're pro way you're providing funding for the control board. That there's money provided immediately to get us up to speed so that we are ahead of the industry in doing prevention and wherever we're borrowing from that that money is on the table not waiting until the first tax revenues come in to fund what the work we need to do thank you so much thank you very much for your time so committee i'm going to give us a few minutes to just take a stretch break and uh, use the facilities if you need to um, we are going to shift gears uh, now for the rest of the day today to be um, Instead of, uh, instead of hearing from more witnesses today, we really need to, to focus on the language of the bill in front of us. I know that you all did some good solid work on going through the language on Friday afternoon, um, but in terms of how much of the bill we've uh, been through, we, we, uh, we've got a bit more work we need to do. Um, so if you wanna take a few minutes now to make note to yourself of some of the issues that you've heard raised in previous testimony or this morning that, that you want to flag when we get to that section of the bill, uh, please do that. Uh, we are at the point now where it is uh, critically important for us to start engaging with the language of the bill. And so um, we are going to begin that work momentarily, um, I think, uh, Legislative Council will be back uh, in just a few moments, so go ahead and take a quick break. So the Thank you for being with us. Sure. So our goal here for the rest of the day is to stay pretty singularly focused on the, the bill language in S54. Um, I know that you discussed some changes that you don't, you've already, the committee has already giving you some direction on from Friday. And so I think I'd like to pick up where where it's logical um, from what you did not get to on Friday so that we can um, discuss the other areas of the bill that we may, might want to see some changes to. Okay. Great. So for the record, Michelle Childs, Office of Legislative Council, and we're still walking through um, S54, um, just kind of a, a once through. And we discussed a, a few, several issues on Friday, and I've already started a draft for those. And then I think once you get through, you can get through the bill today, and then I can work on a draft tonight, and then I can start to have some language for you to look at tomorrow morning. Um, so I think where we generally left off was on page 11 um, we, uh, and um, and we hit a couple of issues that were past that but I think one of the things that we had left was in uh, the last thing that we had discussed was um, kind of I'm going to restructure just reminding you a little bit this section around the coming back in January and, and the board reporting on the the, fisc the second and third fiscal years on the build out positions, appropriations that are needed, um, and the fees, and having those kind of come in in January and bumping um, uh, a couple of the other things that aren't <coughs> quite as timely a little bit later, trying to create some space in there. And then I know that we talked about the timeline a little bit, and, and, and folks weren't necessarily. Um, uh, 
looking to extend the timeline and look at the different dates, but um, I've talked with, I was talking with Michael O'Grady, so he's our deputy for the legal team and he has a lot of regulatory experience and I was just checking with him around what he thinks around the timeline and he he kind of confirmed what my concerns were as he said there's there's no way <laughs> I think it was what he told me it yeah. was not gonna happen yeah. um, and so I would just encourage you as your attorney to um, to really do take a look at the timeline and something that I talked to Mike about maybe um, that he thought was you know he'd be willing to do is if you guys maybe schedule Mike uh, or Mike and Betsy Ann even just for a short time to just do a broad overview of what rulemaking entails and the process and the timeline for how that kind of typically happens. Um, because I know you have an interest that if you're going to move forward with this, you want to make sure that it's workable, that it's really actually doable. And, um, and you know, I know a lot of people are talking about the policy up here, and, and I sometimes get stuck too much down in here trying to be like, yeah, but this piece doesn't fit here, whatever. But I, I think that's also my role is to make sure that you can accomplish your policy goals on the ground with this. And so I would just say, you know, it, it just makes me think of the timeline and talking about how we're going to restructure the report back in January and how we can try to create some more space to make sure that everything can get done. So I'm, I was assuming when I saw that timeline, I mean, it looked pretty aggressive to me. Um, and I was assuming that it maybe came uh, from a perspective of wanting to, not necessarily recognizing how much time it's going to take the board to do the things they need to do, but from the standpoint of wanting to make sure that the legislature has a chance to see it and react to it. I think the initial, um, I think what's happened is, you know, over, you know, certainly from this, I would say maybe from the Senate standpoint, you know, I think they, um, because they've been putting forth proposals for a number of years, you know, they're looking to get to the point of, you know, retail sales as quickly as possible. But then what had happened also is that as the bill progressed, um, more things started kept getting added to the board's responsibility. So what it might have been much more narrow at the beginning, but then, uh, you know, I can, you know, they're, right. the it just started out right it, to exactly recognize exactly. The so they're just yeah. being asked to do more and more things, but yet the timeline has okay. has stayed the same. Um, and so I would just say, suggest at some point, you know, maybe you you hear from. From Mike and Betsy Ann, just about you know what rulemaking, and then we just really examine the timeline. And I can build out what I had originally done for a timeline and make that more specific with a lot with all the new little stuff, or think you know think or the tasks that have to be done. And you can think about that because even just you know, and one of the things you're, discuss, you're discussing clearly is. Um, about whether uh, whether to do the early sales and then the way the proposal that we've discussed is having the early sales still be regulated under the Department of Public Safety while the board is getting up and running and um, and there's been discussion about well would would there be right now it's the medical program isn't slated to, to shift over until January 1st 2021 we're looking at whether or not that could shift over earlier, but again, there's all these different things create more of an administrative burden and to temp, you know may potentially slow things down. And so I just want us to be cognizant of all of that with all of these policy choices. Um, so I think so that was the last section that we really um, had talked about. I think on the section six, the you you know I'll amend that because you're expanding the board from from three members to five members. Um, the section 6A, 6B, and 6C, I don't know if you want to get into those uh, provisions um, or not around the, talking about the money. Um, obviously, you know, it, it, with the expansion to the five members, obviously there's going to need to be a different appropriation, but I don't know if you guys talk about that here or just leave it the way that it is and then let a probes handle that. Um, well, let's fly back. Oh, yes. Who's I have a clarifying question. Yeah, go ahead. Did we land on the, the, the purpose of those two additional commissioners? 
the what the committee decided was that there will be the addition, the one appointment by the treasurer and the one appointment by the attorney general. There would not be specifics about any of those five board members, but that the board shall create an advisory committee. Which right now they're just authorized to create a, a an advisory committee. So one of the things that um, that you guys can come back to or you can discuss now is talking about what I was going to do is incorporate some of the specific issues that were previously in about requiring, you know, like this board hat member has to have a background in this, but incorporating that into the advisory board language and some of the things that y'all have been talking about. So the board shall create an advisory uh, commission and, um, you know, and that advisory commission shall, you know, have members representing, you know, social equity issues, um, you know, background in, you know, business or finance and management or regulatory experience or, Plant science, you know, having that kind of a thing, and then I think, but that was the, I believe, the decision by the committee is to have that those specifics be in the advisory commission rather than being tagged specifically to the board members. Um, so six D auditor of accounts, that's something we just you had flagged. Just that April is a perhaps not the not the best date for that. So assuming that. Um, you would maybe see, uh, depending on the time that you would maybe see the first retail sales in uh, like in this in July of 2021. How long do you want the regulated market up and running before you before you want the auditor of accounts to be looking about whether or not that structure still makes sense once you've started to build out the, the board and the staffing. Um, I don't know how long uh, the auditor would need to kind of to do a review. So you want you know you want some time period for there for him to take a look at it and say here's how it's operating. Now we're you know right this would be I would say you know maybe it would be operating for 18 months before he starts to take a look at it. Um, uh, but. Does that make sense? And Any discussion on that? Right. I mean, if you want a couple of years, you know, what's considered, right. you know, I think you've heard from the, the, the money people that it, it takes a while for you to start to see what they would consider to be a mature market and be able to assess that. Right. John? Uh, I mean, my, my only thought on this, just to sort of keep this short, is if we're going to go and discuss with the timeline, mm -hmm. with Michael Grady and Betsy Ann, Perhaps just flagging that we want to change this yeah. date mm -hmm. okay. and not <laughs> yeah. decide on a date yeah. today right. until we've heard from them. Yes, yeah. that makes sense. Okay, so moving on to Section 7 in the cannabis establishment. Something that I'll tell you that I just want to do from a technical perspective is I just want to go back and compare the definitions I have in here for the different types of licensees with what their authority is under their specific statutory provision that I'm just gonna do a little tweaking and clean up, not substantive, but just so you know, because that'll be something that'll be reflected in the next one is that I think as amendments were made or certain changes, sometimes I, you know, I just wanna make sure the language is consistent, but I would just consider that to be technical. Um, so I will let you know as I did a walk, well, as you know, I did a walkthrough for Commerce yesterday and so one of the things that, uh, that they are working on in that committee are, um, is corporate structure. And so there's a lot of definitions in here having to do with who is an applicant, who is considered to be a principal, who controls, you know, things like that. And those are things that they're working on. So they may be t looking at tweaking those definitions. So that's in play over in Commerce. Um, but I don't know that there was anything that came up for anyone in your discussions around the, um, any of the other definitions? I don't recall, I don't have anything, but let me know if I'm incorrect. Go ahead, John. Uh, this is Jim, one of Jim's things. He, he just posed the question, do we need a wholesaler license? Mm. In general. Just because, you know, in the liquor world, and Marsha's probably a better one to, to talk about this, is, you know, they're getting product from all over the world. I mean, here it's going to be limited to Vermont. And that was Jim's comment. And how did he feel about that? He just posed the question do we even need a wholesaler's license? <laughs> <laughs> 
I, um, I'm not taking a position. I'm just no. Well, talking with people that are probably more knowledgeable of this industry than I am. Uh, one thing that was brought up was um, sometimes it would be easier for the grower to just deliver to a wholesaler and then let that wholesaler go about delivering to the individual retail locations, especially when you have a number of retail locations, but also um, for in-state wineries, they can get a permit that allows them to do a, a direct um, shipment to a retailer also. So give people the option. They can either work with a wholesaler um, who will deliver to a number of different locations for them, or if they want to do business with their local retailer, they could be allowed to do and I believe the deliveries. bill currently has that built-in flexibility. Right. If you look at page 31 on the cultivator license, um, so about talking about what they can do, so they can sell to a wholesaler, product manufacturer, or retailer, or a dispensary. So they would have that option. And I think the wholesaler, the purpose of that is exactly what you said, Marcia, which is to provide additional options mm -hmm. for cultivators who perhaps are just like, I just, I don't want to manage all that, you know, that aspect of it. And um, so. Is it? Is a co-op some kind of other legal entity that we're talking about here? There's nothing in the bill. Mm -hmm. There's nothing in here about that. No, no, no. I'm asking. Oh. In case somebody decides that cabbage should go someplace else, another direction. Oh, I, you know, I don't know much about about cooperatives. Um, so I would not be the person to talk Massachusetts's about Massachusetts's cannabis bill has a co-op model um, in it mm -hmm. for um, marijuana or cannabis cultivators in order to encourage small growers to be able to work together. And um, go up to a certain distribution and production? Yeah, it'd be a certain so production model. level. I forget what it is in Mass law, but um, mm -hmm. it, it is something big. <laughs> huh the, their co-op is pretty big i mean mm -hmm. our but theirs yes their small is our big <laughs> yes but it, it's it's you know it's something to consider mm -hmm. in encouraging small growers potential legal market um anything else on definitions you, you brought up the wholesaler question yeah that was um So I just have one question about Cannabis Testing Laboratory. It's very unclear throughout the statu statute whether that testing lab needs to be independent. Independent meaning? Uh, From cannabis establishments. Okay, it would be a licensed cannabis establishment, one of the licensees. No, I understand okay. that, but independent from so if it's testing, oh, it right. needs to be independent from other cannabis establishments. So that yes. you don't have a- You're a, not doing yourself, you're not self-testing, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. There is, if you look at, um, and I can put in a cross-reference there, but if you look at the testing lab license, I think that there is language in that. If you look at page 36, subsection F, a cannabis establishment that is subject to testing requirements um, shall have its cannabis or products tested by an independent licensed testing laboratory and not a licensed testing laboratory owned or controlled by the license holder of the cannabis establishment. Um, is that enough, better, good enough definition? Uh, to get at the issue of whether or not... It's truly independent? Uh, because it says owned or controlled by the license holder. What about if it's owned or controlled by the investors? What if it's oh, owned okay. and controlled by an employee? What, I understand what your point is, <laughs> right. Okay. Um. Hmm. Um. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. 
Well, I think we need to define that. That's why I was mm -hmm. focusing on the definition section. Okay. Of, of So to give a little direction uh, to how we would like to see this operate functionally, you're looking for um, you're looking for independent testing that is free from any sort of financial relationship with right the licensee, mm -hmm. the principal, the own any owner, mm -hmm. an employee. So that there's true independence. Okay. That there's no connection between the testing laboratory and any other cannabis establishment. Okay. I can look at it. And that's getting into the financial structure because that's right. going to be where you're going to find a lack of independence is that there's an investment in a cannabis establishment, retail or wholesale or whatever it is. And that same investor is making an investment in the testing lab. That's what I want to prevent. Okay. So I will, um, I understand conceptually what you're talking about. I'll um, loop in David Hall, who is working with Commerce on these definitions and this aspect as with regard to applicants. And then I'll CC you. And then maybe we can just have an offline discussion and then yep. you can bring back a proposal for, we can bring back a proposal based on what you want for the committee. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I have a question. If the board wanted to have the Agency of Agriculture doing the testing, is there anything in this language that would preclude them from doing that? No. No, this is strictly, so the, the testing labs is, um, and, and one of the things- Oh, it's for the license. Right, sure. for the license. And then one of the things I wanted to ask you about is about, is it right now that this is, you know, that it can be that they're test, they're getting things from other licensees to do for themselves, this, which is separate and apart from what the board is going to be doing for testing for compliance. All right. And so, again, you have the Ag Lab that can do hemp, S117 and human services, extends it to cannabis. It also allows the Ag Lab to license independent labs to also that meet certain standards to be doing that work as well um, and so the compliance stuff is you know so this is envisioned to be these independent one of the things when we get to this is, is to talk about whether or not you want to allow these these testing labs to also be testing for an individual who's not licensed maybe they want to test their you know if, if, if people are allowed to grow their own, which they are currently, if they wanted to utilize the service of a testing lab, um, would you want to allow the testing lab to service the public generally? And also, would you want them to be able to um, to test for a dispensary? I mean, dispensaries, you know, do, so is that an option too? So right now it's just under the licensees, but that's something to consider. Um, because I think you want to make well, sure that you're encouraging that there are testing labs uh, out there so uh, people have the resources to test. Well, one of the benefits of tax and regulate is that we know that there's unadulterated product. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, having independent testing for both the adult use and medical marijuana, in my perspective, is important. Uh, um, so that, you know, the product is verified that, you know, it doesn't have pesticides. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it doesn't have mold or, or other substances that, that could harm people because that that's one of the true benefits of a tax and regulate system is that people know when they purchase a product, whether it's medical or non-medical, they're getting an unadulterated product. So you would, so you're proposing that you would, they would be able to test for the public and also for dispensaries. Right, and we'd have to tweak the language in the medical dispensary thing because it says the cannabis board cannot make rules that would um, restrict medical dispensaries any more than they're currently restricted, I believe, somewhere. It does, yeah. in, in adopting the new rules. Right, so I, I just want to make, just flag but that, but because this would be a restriction because now that as we've heard from earlier testimony, there is no independent testing required for medical dispensaries. Right. It's per 
permissive. Yes. They're permitted, it's permitted to test for each but it's other. not required. Yeah. yeah. Right. That is a, that I, I think, right. I think I get what you're saying. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to go back up. <laughs> um, so uh, regulation by local government, you're going to talk about that this afternoon, so I'm going to skip over it for now. Um, advertising, we did talk about this on Friday, and I'll just recap a little bit based on my, um, my recollection and then discussions with the, with the vice chairs that there are, um, is that, uh, is that uh, he had proposed um, and I'm working on language of, of looking at um, uh, requiring the board to, uh, to review all advertisements. Um, and, uh, and he sent me a few other states to look at what they do with respect to that for medical programs. Um, the language in the other states has it more so that it's either submitted either at the time of publication or either prior to publication or at the time of publication. Um, you know, so one of the questions is, is would you want to require that the ads cannot be published until they've been approved by the board? Um, and then just think through a little bit about how that may play out logistically. Um, uh, and from a capacity standpoint of, of being able to do that, I, I don't know. I just pose, <laughs> I just pose the questions at times. Well, so. here, here's a, you know, um, one way. Or, I, I understand the capacity issue, but one of the ways around that is to charge a fee for advertising review, so that you're paying for the administration of the adver advertising review program. If if you know, cannabis establishments want to advertise, mm -hmm. and like that. I think there should we should review what's going out there because I do have concerns about potentially misleading advertisements. Nelson, Bob, Marsha, how? Uh, one of the things that we're, we're talking about advertising, I think of all the medicine I'm on, and the one thing I always get is the little package that says this medicine is harm could be harmful in these ways. And it lists us all the things that could occur when you take it. Is there anything in this bill that says when somebody buys a package of this, that this, this could be harmful in these ways that comes with the package when they buy it? There are some provisions in here that specify that warning, certain warnings that have to go on anything that is sold by a retailer. Um, uh, there are also provisions in here about around rules around um, educational materials that would be provided at the point of sale as well. And I can highlight when we go when we go through the specific language. Okay. So just Nelson, to all those indications come from drug trials. Yeah. Because marijuana is a schedule one <laughs> drug, right. prohibited drug. There are drug type trials. Uh, I'm, after this morning's conversation, leaning more towards point of sale advertising only. So, still reviewed all the components that we've talked about, but not going any farther than I can go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's flag that. Hmm? We'll flag that. So I have so looking at doing some language on prior review and allowing the board uh, or putting maybe adding to the list of things that they recommend to you in January in all, in all the fees is a fee for advertising review um, for that. Um, uh, there was also something in looking at the other states that I thought that. Mostly they are very similar to what you have in subsection A here, but one of the things that wasn't in here was a prohibition on prizes, mm. awards, or other incentives for purchases that you might want to consider. So kind of like, a, I mean, usually right now what we're seeing is more that people are trying to sell something with cannabis as the prize, which is not <laughs> allowed. Um, but, uh, you know, they make exception and say, well, you can offer discounts or you can do things like that, but you can't 
um, be like, you know, be a regular customer on a monthly basis for a year and you're entered into a car car or something like that. (laughs) Um, So would you like to see some language on that? Ready? Yes. Okay. Um, We'll see. I've got a couple more people who have questions as well. Marsha and then help. So I am in agreement with Bob that um, I would rather see more of a structure like the way we sell spirits in this state. Once you're in the door, there's advertising and there are displays, um, but there is no other type of advertising that's allowed other than for the store to say that they are a liquor store or liquor agency for the state. Um, now, beer and wine is different, but um, advertising for, for spirits is really restricted basically to the um, price guide that the liquor department issues. So there's no, there's no radio, there's no television, well, for in-state. Now you'll see liquor ads on Manufacturers will have magazine ads and right. Um, yes, they can, and it was always a gentleman's agreement that liquor companies would not advertise on uh, national TV. But that has changed over time. Uh, but you won't see liquor ads on <coughs> for a liquor store for on channel three or but once you're in the store then advertising is allowed people can put up displays they can um, promote their product so it seems to me um, like these this is a decision point because I don't imagine that we need to have a fee for the board to review advertising that is only going to be displayed inside the dispensaries. And so uh, before we go down the the avenue of creating this new structure for reviewing of advertising, um, I think we need to dispense with this, this question. How was that on this topic or was that? Yeah, it's no, it's, it's about maybe Leading advertising, this suggests something. Okay, go ahead. Um, so, I think it's important to communicate why taxed and regulated marijuana is is good for the customer. Um, it's free of impurities. It's um, and and I think if it's done in the right way, it could help. <coughs> divert people from the illicit market to, to to this market. So almost like a good housekeeping stamp of approval or whatever on, on products that this is. So it educates people about why this is being taxed and regulated and why it's better for you than any other product. So. Bob, and then I'll say. Well, I think maybe we're talking about Promotion as opposed to advertising, education as opposed to advertising, that's the distinction that you were drawing. Mm-hmm. I fully believe that we should be putting money in and making sure that people are aware that the regulated market is, you don't go blind when you drink it market. Mm-hmm. Um, but come to Joe's because we have a sale on ounces is not the same thing that I want to see along the interstate. No, I don't think you see anything on no, the interstate. No, <laughs> 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 well, unless it's a non-permanent sign. Yeah. Uh, I just went out and uh, did a thing to search for Vermont for stores, and you get there's tons of them that are coming up and telling me what town and where. Would this be the same type of advertisement that's allowed for these types of establishments, so people know where they are? Because that's an advertisement. Let me go to that web page for whichever one of those stores we want to look at. And it's clear that the beer and wine and spirits and 
all the others, you know, up here in Yankee Wines and Spirits right here in Montpelier or something. So it, how it's do we... It's just telling the location, though. Yeah, yeah. Is that okay? People are going to come to your state and buy. Are they going to drive around the blocks until they find mm. one, or are we going to? Well, I would see <laughs> my that. experience in other states is you can fire up Google Maps and, yeah. yes. and mm -hmm. type in marijuana dispensary and. Right, but a, a lot them. of those, it's not the the dispensaries themselves right. that are doing the advertising. It's other sites that find you know, like if you look at, I think um, one of the witnesses mentioned leadmaps.com, yeah. which oh, is yeah. like yes, that's yeah. not the you know, I don't know, maybe the probably dispensaries probably advertise on that site, but what they do is they aggregate information and and do that, which is right. a little you know, like a Yelp or you know something like that. So it's a little a little different. Um, I would see that as more as information rather than advertising. But, um, and Bob. Unless we had a caveat that basically said you can't, anybody that's licensed by the state cannot participate in it, so you wouldn't be buying an advertisement. That, if it's completely <laughs> independent, it's, it's somebody in on Swana making a website of information that they've compiled, pretty much uncontrollable by us, but trying to say that a licensee can't knowingly buy space there, then that becomes advertisement. And I, right. would think I mean, I think, uh, I don't know, I haven't, I don't really have any background on, on the issue around, you know, advertising or businesses, obviously, um, you know, some kind of complete ban, you have First Amendment concerns. Um, hear how those, those are affected by the mm -hmm. fact that it's federally legal. I don't know, you know, when you talk about uh, advertising for, for alcoholic beverages, I just sent an email to Damien to see if he's got any background or references with regard to how that is regulated. Um, you know, I know that um, in coming up with what is here is that I had originally looked at some of the tobacco, you know, rules around what would be uh, permitted and looked at some other states. Um, so I um, I don't know. Right now, dispensaries are not, are prohibited under state law from from advertising, but I would call that ban suspect. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think that was, when you talk about like a gentleman's agreement, I think there's more just kind of like a, you know, We're not it, has not waves been, because, it has not been challenged, yeah. but um, so, uh, you know, I, committee, I would tend more towards um, pursuing the uh, the fee for review of ads by the board as opposed to trying to uh, trying to do a, a restriction of them. Um, you know, I think the board, I think it's reasonable for the board to look at the content of the advertising and also to look at the. Uh, location of the advertising to make sure that it complies with um, not being targeted towards underage consumption. Um, but I would prefer to kind of leave this um, more or less intact and pursue the fee. But we just, can just as a reminder, there is a provision in here that the board is to adopt rules for advertising as well that are gonna, that are going to be geared towards accomplishing your policy goals that are set forth in subsection A. Um, so that seems reasonable to me. Um, but open to discussion. So do we want to pursue the avenue of having the board, in addition to, to writing the rules around what's allowed in advertising, to set up a fee structure so that they can review the advertising before it goes up? Or do we want to pursue the avenue of point of sale only? And therefore, we need to do a little work on understanding what banning advertising might look like when we suspect there are uh, speech issues there. Bob? I think it's uh, 
easier to loosen the noose than it is to tighten it once things have gotten out of control. I'd rather lean towards keeping it pretty restricted. So do you want to head up a subcommittee to consult with a few folks from Lynch Council and others about what uh, point of sale only restriction would look like? Sure. How, How big is the committee? Hmm? How big is the committee? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess I would rather not get in, in a week and let the the board <laughs> figure this out. That's what they're paid for. Okay. Other thoughts on this? Well, I, actually, I would go with that if we were sending that as maybe not the mandate, but the strong suggestion. That's a first preference. I need you to say a little more what you mean by that. Um, Formulating something now, timeline being so tight. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead and say that. So, I, I mean, I think one way to tackle that is um, the rulemaking and advertising right now is is slightly vague. So we could work on that language um, to achieve some of the concerns that have been discussed today. To ask the Canis Board to, to look at rulemaking with respect to specific issues such as point of sale advertising. Right. Thrown that out there as a proposal um, as, a, as a way to get to this because I, I do share House concerns a bit about trying to tackle um, creating a, a advertising regulatory scheme today. <laughs> um, we, we, well, I do too. That's what I was concerned mm -hmm. you right. were converting. Yeah. Um, but pointing them in a direction, I think, is pointing them in a strong direction. So let's flag that, and when we get to the rulemaking section, and we can see if we want to give any more focused direction um, to the board in terms of rulemaking. Okay. So I will just mention the subsection B. Um, language, which I think may have the effect of accomplishing a lot of what of what Marcia is going for around point of sale in terms of the you the restriction unless you can show that that advertising um, reaches no more than thirty percent of folks who are under twenty one. So um, it may not just be point of sale, but maybe they could have advertisements in a you know, 21 and over music venue or a club or something like that, where they would say, well, you have to you get carded at the door to even come into this particular venue. So you know, those little ads that you see in the restrooms or you know, whatever, those, you know, that kind of stuff, that maybe those would be permitted there in addition to point of sale or whatever, but that you're unlikely to be able to meet that criteria if you're if you just got a, a you know a sign on the on the side of the road or, or wherever it is or you're putting it in seven days or something like that okay i don't mean to be dispositive mm -hmm. i just wanted to remind people that that's there yeah um so Education and there's other provisions within the rulemaking around the build out for education for licensees and for employees. Um, just the section that requires that every three years um, the licensee has to complete an enforcement seminar, um, and that licensees has to ensure that each employee involved in the sale of cannabis and not need to add cannabis products to that. Can you repeat that, Michelle? I'm sorry? Can you repeat that section about education? Oh, yep. So this is on the bottom of page 19, top of page 20. Um, so that every, so licensee has to complete an enforcement seminar every three years conducted by the board. 
and they can't have their license renewed unless they've um, complied with the terms of the, of the program. There's also something in rulemaking that we'll see in a few minutes around that they have to do this. And so they'll build this section kind of out more through rules. Um, subsection B, licensee has to ensure that every employee involved in sale of cannabis, and I'm going to add cannabis products on there, um, has to complete a training program approved by the board prior to selling. Um, and at least once every 24 months thereafter. Um, so this is another Jim comment. Um, Jim likes the DLC training model. Can we try that for Mark? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I believe it's all owners and managers must attend Perhaps I think he wants to have DLC training. A seminar in person, and then that manager or owner can can train their staff um, with a DLC approved program, and they have packages. Or you can go online and take it. Um, but the people who are in charge of the establishment must do the face-to-face -face training periodically. Um, right. And then all of their staff need to be trained as well. I think well. that that's what this is modeled after. If you look at A, the licensee has to complete the seminar periodically, mm -hmm. and then B is that the licensee has to ensure that each employee, so whether it's a manager or, you know, point of sale person mm -hmm. or whatever, um, completes the training program. Um, right. So I don't know if this exactly matches up, but I think conceptually it's envisioned to be very similar. Mm -hmm. And then um, again, the board is required to, to work on rules that's going to further refine the requirements for, for those two things. Yeah. So what they found, and I think it was mentioned earlier this morning, that face-to-face um, -face classes have a much higher rate of compliance than the online or uh, other types of education that's provided. So those are seem to be very effective. And we'll see more on that in rulemaking. Yes. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, so moving on to rulemaking. Uh, so subdivision so one A is relating to how it would apply to all licensees, so all type of 5 to 5 licensees. So we can just go through the list. So the, the applications in A, qualifications in B. Um, I will just note that that one, subdivision 1B, is something that Commerce is looking at as well. Um, oversight, inspection, record keeping, F, employment and training requirements. Security, uh, restrictions on advertising, marketing, uh, and signage. So, um, do you want to talk a little bit more about building that out? I mean, it wouldn't necessarily maybe structurally fit right there, but I could put something back in the advertising section around around the rules. Um, so. This list, if we can, before we dive into the advertising, if this says that the rules shall include, um, and I'm looking at G, physical security, video, and alarm requirements, does that mean that every licensee, every license type has to include video um, and alarm requirements. So the reason I'm getting at this is because I could imagine um, outdoor growers, particularly mm -hmm. the ones who are small scale growers, um, using a different type of security than, than you know, some sort of alarm a wired alarm out in the back field. Where I mean, you, you could say security requirements including any appropriate lighting, physical security, video, and alarm requirements. 
and that would be permissive of the different tiers. And, that they're, and they're going to make a distinction and say, is it appropriate in this kind of context and not in the other? mentioned back in the definition section so one of the things that is um, well, well we'll get to there I'll, I'll let my scoop too much all right so uh yep. so for i health and safety requirements does that encompass education and prevention in the health no i would think about that in terms of um you know uh OSHA things having to do with oh, okay. employees, having to do with uh, you know if you're a candidate, if you're a product manufacturer, you're you right. know right. whatever you're doing there to make sure that you're okay. Um, like the respirator that yep. we saw. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So regulation of additives. Um, Procedures for seed to sale traceability of cannabis, um, including any requirements for tracking software, uh, storage and transportation, sanitary requirements, procedures for renewal, procedures for suspension and revocation, requirements for banking and financial transactions, and that's something that Commerce is, is look, taking a look at. And then top of page 22, policies and procedures for conducting outreach and participating participation in the regulated market by diverse groups of individuals who have been uh, disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition. So for cultivators, um, John has a question. No, I, I just want to go through this list mm -hmm. before we just jump. Sure. So we're going to get back to advertising. Is this the only reference to advertising in, in the rule rulemaking? Yes, because so. it would apply to any of them. Because in what we're thinking typically of retailers advertising, but if you're a small grower, how are you getting the word out to the product manufacturers and the retailers and the dispensaries that you're a small grower who's growing these five different types of strains? You know, how is it? How are they able to know that unless you're doing some type of advertising? Okay. Well, let's talk about advertising. That's H right now. Well, I. I do agree with Michelle, it's probably good, better to go back up. And if we're going to refine advertising, we refine it above this because it's just, it's going to be hard it's, yep. to do it here. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so I have the other things on advertising that I'll work on the language. John, if you want to work with me on anything else that you want to kind of maybe put in the other specific statutory section on, uh, that, on, on advertising that might um, sure. further address stuff, I'm happy to work with you on that or go back okay. and forth and then we can okay. come up with some with a proposal that you can make to the committee. Um, this, this is, excuse me, um, this is probably covered in um, Procedures for suspension and revocation of licenses, but I, I really want to make it clear. You know, procedures for the sale of product to, or the use of the product by anyone 21 years or younger. I, I mean, mm -hmm. specific looking yeah. at what that means. Right. That you, your interest is in saying that your license may be revoked. Yeah, but I want to spell as a, this, as a consequence uh, of of selling to the minor. Yeah, steps, and it's not just suspension rates, steps Wait, to this prevent. this is related to advertising? Not really, I'm sorry. No, no. it's rulemaking, no. period. Okay, rulemaking, okay. Yeah. Um. Rulemaking around the prevention of the use of cannabis mm -hmm. by people 21 years 
under the age of 21. Mm -hmm. Inclu including enforcement, which is like what li liquor control does now. That they have undercover people going in to make sure there aren't sales to people under the age of 21. That's not really spelled out anywhere in this bill. Right. You might want to do that more in the suspension and revocation section. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know how to really pop around on this look on this iPad really fast to like without making everybody's eyes bug out when I spin through. Um, but but I will take note of that around the suspension and revocation. Action on youth. Right. And you can have, this is the thing, it's something that is not in here that you may want to duplicate and is that, um, is, you know, there's the provisions in Title VII, the criminal provisions for a licensee who sells underage or, and also um, you don't have, uh, and, and, and the, and the and the, para, and the corollary to that is then for, and then there's penalties for youth who try to buy underage. Right, so but I, I, I'm not just concerned about criminal penalties. Right, okay. You know, the, 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 the criminal conviction is much more difficult to get mm -hmm. than a civil penalty of some form. So, I mean, there needs to be both criminal and civil. Right. Okay, so you want to beef up the language on suspension and yeah. revocation. Yeah, and, and I'm just saying one yeah. way to do that is the way it was done in S41. They have a separate section, 241, separate section on youth. Yes. And, and if there's a specific section that you're thinking yep. of or you want to send to me. I'll send it to you. I mean, I wrote that one too, but it's after you time. You don't have it <laughs> just cataloged, right? I've written so many of these bills over the year, they're starting to blend together. No, I mean, and, <laughs> No, I just, you know, because, you know, okay, criminal penalty. Sure. You know, if, if an employee of a cannabis establishment sells to an underage person, I doubt we're bringing a criminal case against the establishment. Right. Okay. So if I had, I thought that with regard to the suspension and revocation that I picked up the language from 241, but if there's something that's in 241 that I address suspension and revocation as it applies to underage sale, uh, I can go back and take a look at okay. that. Or if you have certain provisions. Well, well there's other provisions too. Like, you know, a marijuana establishment shall not permit a person under the age of 21 to enter a building or enclosure on the premises where marijuana is located. This, you know. That's in 241. It's nowhere in this bill. So I, you're talking about the I do. I'm remember, tired. I had a, a whole specific, had a specific list section of use provisions. in the use section. I mean, that was said youth, right? Is that what I'm yes. recalling? Okay. Yes. Okay. I will go back and take a look at that. I, I just want to make sure that, that I think it's important to spell that out somewhere in the bill that we are trying to make an attempt to protect children from the use of marijuana. I mean, if for no other reason, so the people understand that we're trying to do that. I mean, people outside of this room. Sorry. Sure. You know what, I can actually, do you want, would it be helpful if at this point we just, I can just pull up 241 in that section on you. Is it, do you want to do that now and see what let's, provisions you want me to include? Let's be aware that we're now into the lunch hour and we all might benefit from an opportunity to eat lunch and go get some fresh air for a few minutes. So can we pick back up with sure. the 241 right. language after lunch? Um, and then uh, if there were any other areas of rulemaking that you had thoughts on? Bank banking and uh, oh. all of that. So let's pick this up um, at 1.15. Have an hour, get some fresh air. We're going to work hard this afternoon, so.